Number 10, Portia de Rossi. In her 2010 groundbreaking memoir, Unbearable Lightness, Portia de Rossi reveals the pain and illness that haunted her for decades, from a time she was a 12-year-old girl working as a model in Australia through her early rise to fame as a cast member of the hit television show Ally McBeal. She also detailed her struggles with and while living in the public eye and recounted how she survived on 300 calories a day and took 20 laxatives daily trying to maintain a weight of 82 pounds. According to her memoir, Portia both starved herself and putting her life in danger and concealing from herself and everyone around her the seriousness of her illness and described the elaborate rituals around food that came to dominate hours of every day. The actress did this all while terrified that the truth of her sexuality would be exposed in the tabloids and revealed the heartache and fear that comes from living a life in the closet, which was only magnified by her unrelenting desire to be thinner, more in control of her body and the number of calories she consumed and spent. But it it wasn't all bad, Portia also recounted how falling in love with Ellen DeGeneres helped her develop a healthy body image, embrace her sexual orientation, and gain inner peace. Number 9, Janice Dickinson. A strange encounter with Bill Cosby in 1982 was described in the 2002 memoir No Lifeguard on Duty by the self anointed world's first supermodel, Janice Dickinson. In her book, she reveals real moments that she experienced with Cosby and goes into great detail when it comes to taking back the narrative. Janice mentioned how Cosby allegedly answered his hotel room door in nothing but a towel and kissed her. He then took her to dinner and suggested that she follow him back upstairs. The memoir was pretty explosive at the time and would come back into relevance in 2018 when she chose to testify in court to Cosby's crimes. The comedian was once known to millions as America's dad, famous for his clean brand of family comedy and his award-winning work with children's programming. So Janice's memoir really did help expose Cosby's double life, as eventually more than 50 women came out, claiming that the star slipped them illicit substances and took advantage of them while they were unconscious. And in April of 2018, an 80-year-old Cosby was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in prison, although he would eventually be released in 2021. Number 8, Corey Feldman. In his deeply personal 2013 memoir, child star and teen heartthrob Corey Feldman exposes the darkness that loomed behind his rise to fame. Although he undoubtedly had a successful career, famous friendships, and high profile relationships, Corey reveals a side to his star studded life that no one knew about, and it's full of tragedy. He came from a broken family that he emancipated himself from at the age of 15. As a teenager, he suffered physical, emotional, and sexual violence. The Stand By Me star was also arrested and struggled with addiction throughout his time as a successful working actor. But most shockingly, Corey also implied that his close friend Corey Haim's lifelong battle with addiction was the result of being preyed upon by a powerful older man. Following the book's publication came rampant speculations about the identity of the offender, and it's something that readers still argue about to this day. His memoir, Choreography, weaves a heartbreaking story of pain and survival that reveals just how dark the industry can really be. Number 7, Holly Madison. Former Playboy Bunny and Girls Next Door star Holly Madison dished on how oppressive life with Hugh Hefner really was in 2015's Down the Rabbit Hole. Madison described the many bizarre rules and rituals that Hefner imposed upon his girlfriends. For instance, that they needed to wear matching flannel pajamas, engage in a group dressed in tiny skirts and bralettes, and had a daily curfew of 9pm. The memoir tells the story of Madison's time with Hefner from 2001 to 2008 and its aftermath. She goes into great detail about the reality of her life behind the cameras, how her depression in the Playboy Mansion reached harrowing depths, yet she felt trapped there. She also opened up about her unwillingness to admit to anyone how sad she really was, and Hefner's emotional control over her. The book also explores her time on the reality show The Girls Next Door and the weirdness that was pop culture in the early 2000s. When speaking about her book, Holly said, quote, I felt like I had something to say about being in the midst of that whole thing that was going on where Paris Hilton and Jessica Simpson and Kendra were so celebrated, and I was a part of it too, for being dumb on TV. Part of the reason I wanted to write the book was to show the other side of it, which goes to show you just how much of it was all for the cameras. Number 6, Shania Twain. The Grammy winning country singer confronted her childhood demons when she wrote her 2011 memoir From This Moment 
moment on, describing how her stepfather Jerry was physically, sexually and verbally violent towards her and her mother Sharon. In a frank and often shocking autobiography, the singer reveals graphic and personal details about her rags to riches story and the price of ambition and success. Throughout her memoir, it also became clear that Shania experienced a harrowing degree of poverty and hunger. For instance, she claimed that sometimes there was only bread and mustard for her and her four siblings to eat, and they often wore plastic bread bags to cover their shoes to protect their feet during winter, and regularly went to school without lunch. The singer also had to deal with a double betrayal in her life. She wrote about the heartache that she went through when she found out about the affair between her husband of 14 years, Robert Lang, and her best friend. As a result, Shania became so distraught that she literally lost her voice to spasmodic dysphonia, which left her unable to sing. So her memoir explores how she worked through all that heartbreak. Number 5. Sharon Stone She became a Hollywood icon and a household name after her role in Basic Instinct, and in a 2021 memoir, The Beauty of Living Twice, she finally reveals the vulnerability behind her femme fatale persona. She goes into great detail about her experiences in Hollywood, like how she was tricked into that famous shot in Basic Instinct, and ill-equipped for fame when it finally came to her. She was also routinely taken advantage of in the male-dominated film industry. She claims that the filmmakers were not entirely honest about what they captured with the camera, and so they didn't have her complete consent to put that scene in the film. Quote, I do think we have to create a think tank that really addresses what is a crime, what is a felony, what is consent. The name of her memoir actually comes from a life-changing brain hemorrhage that she suffered in 2001 that almost killed her. It left her without the basic ability to function and she ended up losing her family, her career and a huge part of her life, which she had to start again from the ground up. Stone also talks about how she went through a childhood of and violence to a career in an industry that actually brought back a lot of those memories for her. Although in Hollywood, it was all hidden under the cover of money and glamour. Number 4. Leah Remini A former longtime Scientologist, King of Queens star Leah Remini opened up about her experiences in the church in her 2015 memoir, Troublemaker. As a teenager in the church's C organization, Remini said that she was reprimanded for studying by the pool at the Scientology-run Sand Castle Hotel in Florida, and as a pun was taken out to sea on a boat, thrown overboard, and nearly drowned by a group leader. Not only that, but she was also once fined $40,000 after confessing to stealing food from the headquarters 20 years earlier. In her memoir, Leah also made some shocking allegations about several well-known Hollywood celebrities. In fact, she recalled a time that her and her husband, Angelo, spent time at Tom Cruise's Beverly Hills mansion when he invited a group of well-known Scientologists and other celebrities, including the Smiths. She actually called Will and Jada Pinkett Smith famous friends of the church, and even mentioned the Scientology school that they opened, revealing that despite Jada's denial, she is indeed good friends with Tom Cruise and an active member of the controversial religion. Number 3. Jeanette McCurdy Described as both heartbreaking and hilarious, iCarly star Jeanette McCurdy's bluntly titled memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, gives fans a glimpse into what really went on behind the cameras. Something that up until now, fans have only been able to speculate about. Jeanette exposes her traumatic experiences on Nickelodeon and the disturbing truth about how she was mistreated by her mother, who pushed her to be a child star, noting that the persona she was known for throughout her youth and her young adult life was a front forced upon her by her mom, who, in addition to everything else, was extremely physically inappropriate with both her and her brother, even when they were teenagers. Jeanette also discusses the perils of young fame and reveals that she developed developed anorexia as a child, and talks about why she ultimately quit acting altogether. She also details numerous instances where she felt exploited as a teen actor, both on and off set. The actress refers to the person behind the demands as simply the creator throughout the memoir, never naming them. She simply describes them as mean-spirited, controlling and terrifying, calling a time when she was filming an episode of iCarly that he insisted that she wear a bikini instead of a one-piece swimsuit which she preferred. The revelations in her 
new book are absolutely shocking and they really expose the traumatic experience of being a child star. Number two, Christina Crawford. At the height of her fame in the 1940s, Joan Crawford had a considerable reputation to uphold. She won a 1945 Best Actress Academy Award for the lead role in Mildred Pierce. She lived in a beautiful house in Brentwood, LA and used her wealth to adopt and raise four children, including Christina Crawford. For all of this, Joan was celebrated in the public eye and had extensive magazine spreads about her happy family life. But to her daughter, the facade was a complete lie and eventually her frustration at the discrepancy between her mother's private existence and her public reputation bubbled over. In 1978, she published Mummy Dearest, which told the truth about her mother's character, that she was a sadistic perfectionist. It was the first tell-all celebrity memoir to talk so openly about childhood and subsequently was a worldwide sensation upon its release. In fact, it stayed at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for 42 weeks and even resulted in the 1981 film adaptation starring Faye Dunway that would go on to become a cult hit. To this day, most people associate Joan Crawford with that infamous scene where she launches into a vicious tirade after discovering Christina's dresses were hung up on wire clothes hangers. So it's safe to say that her reputation never recovered. And coming in at number one, Rose McGowan. In her 2018 memoir, Brave, the outspoken actress takes readers behind the scenes of her life in Hollywood, where she has become known as one of the fiercest and realest women fighting to expose the ugly truth about Harvey Weinstein and the systematic misogyny that has defined the industry for so long. The most outspoken of all of Weinstein's accusers, McGowan opens up about when she first met the movie mogul at the Sundance Film Festival, but only refers to him in her book as the monster. She was at the premiere of her 1997 film, Going All The Way, when he sat behind her. The next day, she was sent to his hotel room, where the two talked about films and her acting goals. But as he walked her out, McGowan writes that he pushed her into his bathroom, forcibly backed her into the wall, and ripped off her clothes. But most shockingly, after the incident, the actress was driven to a photo op with her Phantoms co-star Ben Affleck. When she told him what happened, he simply said, Damn it, I told him to stop doing that. Her memoir couldn't be more relevant to current events, as to date, 84 women have come forward with allegations against Weinstein, and he is currently serving a prison sentence of 23 years. Hollywood seems all glitz and glamour, but quite a few celebrities have referenced the underlying darkness that occurs behind the scenes. Jim Carrey, one of the biggest and highest paid actors of our time, has shared his thoughts on Hollywood since retiring from the spotlight. After the Chris Rock Will Smith Oscars Slap incident. Carrie shared his opinions on the standing ovation Will Smith received when winning an Oscar later that night. Hollywood is just spineless, and it really felt like it was a clear indication that we aren't the cool club anymore. Carrie went on to say that Smith should have been escorted from the Dolby Theater after slapping Rock for making an insensitive joke about his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. In March 2022, Carrie announced to Access Hollywood that he was probably retiring from acting. Well, I'm retiring. Yeah, probably. I'm being fairly serious, he shared. It depends. If the angels bring some sort of script that's written written in gold ink that says to me that it's going to be really important for people to see. I might continue down the road, but I'm taking a break. Carrie added, I feel like, and this is something you might never hear another celebrity say as long as time exists, I have enough. I've done enough. I am enough. Our second celebrity is Demi Lovato. Demi Lovato starred in many Disney Channel movies and shows like Camp Rock, Princess Protection Program, and Sunny with a Chance. But on a podcast, Lovato shares she, as well as many of her co-stars, were subjected to harsh treatment and multiple strict rules and regulations while working for the company. She said, you can't be seen at a party with a red cup in your hand because it looks like you're drinking. There was this website called Ocean Up that would take all scandalous things that were happening to Disney actors and put it on there. So we lived in fear of that website. 
I didn't have food in my hotel room. They wouldn't let me eat the snacks in the mini bar. Then my security walked by my room and was made aware that they had barricaded me into my hotel room. They put furniture outside my door so that I couldn't get out and sneak out and eat if I wanted to. It was that level of controlling when it came to my food, which just made my eating troubles worse. She also stated that she felt that she was practically taking care of her own family. At a certain point, I was paying for the roof over my whole family's head, and my dad had quit his job to become my manager, so his income was coming right from me. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, and there was just that pressure of, I'm paying for everything, and like I need to keep going, because if things start to disappear, so does the finances. Our next celeb on the list is Isla Fisher. The actress nearly drowned while filming a scene in Now You See Me. Fisher discussed what went wrong with the stunt, and it is horrifying. I was in a tank of water. My character is submerged in a tank, and piranhas are dropped on her head, she says. And whilst we were there, we shot it over three and a half days. Even though I had a quick release magnetic thing on my handcuffs, the chain that went between my ankles and my wrists was not able to be broken. And it got stuck underneath the slat and I was trapped. The actor also discussed the kill switch in the tank. There was a quick release switch that could have emptied the tank of water in 70 seconds. However, as a result of being tangled, Fisher was unable to reach for the switch. I was very scared and I was banging and saying, set me free, but everybody just thought I was doing fabulous acting. They thought I was being Meryl Streep in that tank. Actually, I was drowning. I guess Hollywood really wanted that good take. Our next celebrity is model Miranda V. The modeling world seems harmless, but darkness looms. Miranda accused Gigi and Bella Hadid's father of inappropriate physical behavior in a lengthy Instagram post in February 2018. Thank you, Kate Upton. It is time people like at Paul Marciano and Mohammed Hadid get exposed for who they really are. I met with Paul at his guest headquarters. That's actually an apartment. I thought it was a professional meeting, but it was just me, him, and Champagne, where he inappropriately touched me in an apartment. All to get a test shoot for guests. Former Disney Child star Allison Stoner exposes Hollywood with her new podcast and some of the claims are alarming. Allison said, I lost the ability to relate to non-famous experiences after the age of eight. Imagine on your eighth birthday you could never walk outside again without being stopped, asked for photos, or followed unless you wore a disguise or brought security with you. Allison also mentioned the horror when they had to kiss both Dylan Sprouse and Cole Sprouse for an episode of The Sweet Life. The experience left them with conflicted feelings. Your character may have some arc or transformation that isn't evident upon reading the script of the first episode, Stoner explained. So writers and executives might decide to make your character do anything on the next episode and it's assumed that you're gonna agree to whatever is scripted. My first kiss and several of the times I experienced kissing all happened on camera. On camera. Was I ready for that? No, I felt young and uncomfortable, Stoner said, but they were already under contract and didn't want to appear difficult. Another celeb that has exposed Hollywood is Selena Gomez, the superstar who boasts 430 million followers on Instagram, often speaks about the downside of being famous, telling Interview Magazine in 2020 that everything she does causes a reaction, saying, the sad part is I don't remember a time when that wasn't the case. What has kept me afloat is that I know eventually it'll be somebody else, and I don't mean that in a negative way. She said, adding that fame has still allowed her to talk about things that are important to her. A huge part of why I have a platform is to help people. That's why I think I'm okay with the magnitude. I mean, I'm not really okay with it, but I'm gonna say that I am because it's worth it. Perhaps the celebrity with the most famous Hollywood horror story is Miss Britney Spears. In 2008, Jamie Spears, her dad, was granted the conservatorship after Britney reportedly struggled with mental health issues and was hospitalized. After 
after Britney was released, a Los Angeles court made the conservatorship permanent, giving her father power over all her finances and her medical decisions. Although Britney was an adult at the time, she was treated like a prisoner and says she was not allowed to leave her house unless granted permission. Her father was making more money than her because he was taking a huge percentage of her earnings and not telling her. Wow, what a father he is. The greed of Hollywood doesn't stop there though. Scientology, a popular organization in Hollywood, has been known to take insane amounts of money from its members, claiming the payments will get them into a higher level in the afterlife. Actress Leah Remini, a former Scientologist, exposes the organization for the way they ruined her life after she left. The actress, who was brought into the church as an 8 year old after her mother converted to the religion, slammed the organization for its alleged scare tactics and seemingly helping certain members avoid jail for various horrible crimes. Leah met famous Scientologist slash actor Tom Cruise while still in the organization but had to pay $1 million to do so which she paid. After leaving, Leah sued the organization for alleged stalking and hacking. She states she reportedly had cars chasing her and following her every single day and had hackers hack into her bank account and steal thousands of dollars all because she left the organization. Yikes. Not all Hollywood drama comes from Hollywood though. And this was the case for Kim Kardashian in Paris. In October 2016, while on a work trip to Paris, Kardashian was robbed at 3 a.m. while alone in her hotel. She was tied up and blindfolded while men in masks raided the hotel room for money. In the end, $10 million worth of jewelry was stolen as well as two cell phones. Kim's sisters and bodyguards were at the club while everything took place and Kim decided to stay home because she was tired. Boy, Boy, was that a life changing mistake. Kim recalled the fear that she felt during a conversation with the concierge, who was also held hostage in that moment. She says to the concierge, I'm like, what is happening? Are we gonna die? Just tell them I have children. I have babies. I have a husband. I have a family. Like, I have to get home. Tell them, take anything you want. Two French judges later charged 12 people in relation to that robbery. Kardashian, who shares four kids with ex Kanye West, has said that she almost lost herself in the year following the crime. Explaining on the Alec Baldwin show in 2018, I was never depressed, but I wasn't motivated to get up and work like I used to. It shook me. However, the reality star also shared that she has learned to feel grateful for the experience in a way. There was a lot of me that measured who I was by how much I had. I thought, oh, I'm worth so much, she noted. That needed to change in me. Our final celebrity of the day is Miley Cyrus. Although Hannah Montana was a family friendly show, starring in it gave Miley an identity crisis, she says. I had gone from being a character almost as often as I was myself. And actually, the concept of the show is that when you're this character, when you have this alter ego, you're valuable. You've got millions of fans, you're the biggest star in the world. And then the concept was that when I looked like myself, when I didn't have the wig on anymore, nobody cared about me. I wasn't a star anymore. So that was drilled into my head, Cyrus explained. I really had to break that, and I think that's maybe why I almost created a characterized version of myself at times, in the way of being aware of how other people see me. I never created a character where it wasn't me, but I was aware of how people saw me, and I maybe played into it a little bit, Cyrus continued. Speaking of her persona after, Cyrus has also talked about how the costumes and makeup took their toll on her, likely causing some body dysmorphia. I'm this fragile little girl playing a 16 year old in a wig and a ton of makeup. It was like toddlers and tiaras. She said that being made to look like somebody she wasn't and made pretty for so many years meant that when it ended, she didn't know who she was. Starting off this countdown at number 10, we have Phoebe Cates. At the peak of her career in the 80s, she would be cast in over 20 movies and was best known for starring in Gremlins and Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Fame came fast for the former actress and with her new and busy career, she was thriving in the industry. So while being at the top of your career, why would you all of a sudden just end it at such a young age? Well, it turns out she was more concerned with motherhood than anything and after trying to be a mother of two, and a full-time actress, Phoebe decided to become a full-time mom instead. It has been 30 years since leaving the big screen, and overall, she's actually kept a very low profile while also opening up her own boutique in New York City. 
So apparently, rumor has it that if you actually go to her boutique, you might see her in there. Moving along to the next spot at number nine is Terrence Howard. The American actor has starred in numerous films and TV shows, but you'll probably recognize him most from the movie Iron Man or the TV series Empire. Once Terrence finished his role in the five year running show Empire, he vowed that he would never act again. He said that quitting acting meant that he didn't need to pretend anymore, and even though his future plans were unknown, he knew he wanted to focus on bringing truth to the world. Terrence would later go on more in depth of the truth of his retirement, where he says that he spent 37 years in the industry pretending to be people that he isn't. He began making discoveries of his personal life and goals, and he believes that he would rather be teaching the truth rather than fictional. A little vague of an explanation, but uh, whatever makes him happy. I'm still not understanding the truth part. Like, let us know the truth rather than saying I want to speak the truth, you know? Moving on to number eight is Rick Moranis. The Canadian actor may not ring a bell until you hear that he was the main character in the childhood classic, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Legendary movie. I love that movie. That was so fun. His acting career was filled mostly by 80s comedy movies as he starred in Ghostbusters, The Flintstones, and Parenthood. Having a successful career in the industry and well-known movies under his name, he would suddenly just disappear from the acting scene and no one really knew why at the time. The sudden retirement was sadly due to the death of his wife who passed away from cancer. Because of this, Rick would completely shift his time to dedicate himself to raising his two children, and he became a stay-at-home dad. The hiatus was only supposed to be a break, but eventually the break led to him not working on any movies ever since then. The former actor confesses that he does miss the people and nature of the film industry as parenting is just a very different lifestyle, but he made it clear that he has no regrets about his career decisions. Moving on to the next celebrity on this list, and number seven, we have Karen Parsons. The retired actress is most known for her beloved character on the culture defined show, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. After the show ended in 1996, it would have been likely that fans would follow Karen to her other acting endeavors, but she seemingly wasn't able to find success in any other roles. After constant devastation and little to show for it, she grew very frustrated and eventually would lose her passion for acting, making her just move on to other things. She started working for a nonprofit foundation called The Sweet Blackberry, which is a charity that is determined to teach children about black history heroes through films. In 2019, she also released a children's novel called How High the Moon, and then in 2020, another book called Flying Free. Moving on to the next spot at number six is Peter Ostrom. You might not know Peter just by his name, but you'll definitely know him from his iconic role in the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory as he played the main character, Charlie. After filming finished, the child star would be offered a three movie part deal, but Peter did not sign the contract. Peter's role in Willy Wonka would be his first and his last as he would decide to quit his acting career right before it took off at the age of 12. The quick decision would be made simply because he just fell in love with a different profession, I guess, or passion at the time since he was 12. The former child star enjoyed watching veterinarians at work on the animals that his family had, and because of this experience, it single-handedly changed his future as he became a veterinarian himself. Giving up the spotlight to become a veterinarian may seem like an odd decision, but acting was just not his passion, he says, and he found that career passion with being a veterinarian. Damn, he really chose horses over Willy Wonka movies. Taking the halfway spot at number five is Angus T. Jones. You may not recognize the name because, um, I wouldn't, but you definitely know him as the kid from the sitcom Two and a Half Men. He played in the show from 2003 all the way to 2013, and it seemed like we watched him basically grow up as he started the show at just nine years old, and when he left the show, he was 19. At one point in 2010, he was the highest paid child star in television, so it may come as a shock to you when he left just a few years later. The real reason that the young star left the show in Hollywood in general was because he became very dedicated to his fate and actually started slamming the TV show for how vulgar it was. He was in a moral conflict by being on the show because he just didn't feel that it followed his religion. So he eventually called it quits because of his religious beliefs and became a more normal young adult by attending college. The former actor would go on to study environmental studies, but would later transfer his major to Jewish studies. Now, the former child star is living in LA and is working as president of an event entertainment company. Taking the countdown by storm, at number four is held by the child star, Mara Wilson. You probably know her for her role in Matilda or Miss Doubtfire, but have you ever wondered where the promising young actress went? I always wondered. 
until I started this job and I found out. Well, she played numerous characters as a child star and instead of continuing her acting career, she backed away from the industry at the young age of 13. Moving on to the future, in 2016, she became a writer and released an autobiography depicting her accidental fame, as she called it. The book highlighted the now retired actress and her struggle with growing older and feeling as if her appearance didn't fit the Hollywood standard. Furthermore, in her book, she states that at 13, she was faced with a decision to get cosmetic surgery, audition for cute and funny friend characters, or just accept herself and give up her acting career for good. And well, we all know what decision she made because I already said it. Now she's the full time writer and director and has chosen a whole new life for herself. Moving on to one of the top three spots, at number three is Jack Gleason. The former actor has only been part of a handful of roles, but one of them includes the fan favorite TV series Game of Thrones. Jack played one of the main characters in the series from 2011 to 2014, but hasn't played in anything since. Due to the success of the show, Jack had the opportunity of acting for a living full time, but decided against it for very understandable reasons. In a statement made in an interview, Jack said that he stopped because he wasn't enjoying it as much as he used to. He mentioned that acting used to be something he did for fun with his friends or sometimes in the summer. It was once something that he very much enjoyed, but when you make a living from something, it kind of just changes your relationship with it sometimes. So once his time on Game of Thrones came to an end, he felt some sort of relief and just decided that his acting career would come to an end altogether. After his retirement, he went on to study philosophy in Dublin. Coming in our second place, we have Daniel Day Lewis. The talented British actor has won three Oscars, all for Best Actor, four BAFTA awards, and has even been knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. But his acting days in Hollywood are over after his representative released a statement in 2017 stating that Daniel will no longer be working as an actor, adding that it was a private decision and that he will not be making any further comments on the subject. This statement was released after receiving his third and final Oscar for his role in Phantom Thread. So it came as a surprise, because he just won. After being silent on the matter for quite some time, Daniel would later confess in an interview that quitting acting was something he had to do. This was due to overwhelming amount of sadness he faced while working on the film Phantom Thread. He even acknowledged that before making the film, he had no intention of quitting. So it's basically the movie's fault. Daniel also mentioned that he still can't quite figure out exactly what triggered him to quit for good after that movie, but said that he just needed to start to believe in the responsibility and values of what it means to be an actor. Now, being retired for a few years, he feels a different type of sadness, but in a good nostalgic way, he says, when looking back at his acting days. He could come back at any moment, really, right? You can leave and come back. Making our way to number one is Janet McCurdy. Former child star played a leading role in Nickelodeon show iCarly and would move on to co-star on Sam and Cat alongside Ariana Grande. That being said, her acting career would not go further beyond Nickelodeon and it came to an end in 2014. Though it was short lived, she had a very successful career in Hollywood but confessed that she resented it. This resentment was due to many factors. Firstly, it was because she started acting at six years old, which she was put into acting by her mom. and by 10, she was the main financial support of her family. She never wanted to be in the industry, but forced herself to continue because she felt pressured to do so for the well being of her family. The former actress grew extremely unhappy, especially when she was at the peak of her career. When she initially made the decision to call it quits, her agents and managers said that she would be crazy to leave during such a high part in her career, but she stuck to her word and she hasn't looked back since. With the 2021 reboot of her show iCarly, she still would not get involved, which which fans were genuinely surprised by. But thankfully, after announcing her retirement, she went on to become a writer and director, giving her a lot more satisfaction in her career. Taking spot number 10 on our countdown list is Gilbert Gottfried. If you've ever wondered if a tweet would be enough to end your entire Hollywood career, the answer is yes. Back in 2011, the comedian decided to send out some tweets that only he thought was funny. It was following the tragic tsunami that happened in Japan and took the lives of over 15,000 people. In in the midst of it, he tweeted out a handful of insensitive jokes about it. Some of them are just a bit too risky to say here on YouTube, but one of them said, I will quote it, I just split up with my girlfriend, but like the Japanese say, there'll be another one floating by any minute now. At the time, he was the voice of Affleck Duck and they fired him immediately, which is not shocking. He issued an apology immediately after seeing the damage he had done, but he was instantly blacklisted from Hollywood. 
He now does cameo, if you're wondering what he's up to these days, and he even has a podcast that many people didn't even know about. Moving on to number nine, we have Danny Mathers. She is known for starring on TV series like The Bold and the Beautiful and Badass, but she's mainly known for her work as a Playboy model. Unfortunately, both sides to her career came to an end after she did something very petty and disrespectful online, and then got a taste of instant karma. Back in 2016, she posted an image on her social media of a naked 70 year old woman at the gym and captioned it, if I can't unsee this, then you can't either. She immediately got backlash from her post because it was extremely rude and also very invasive since the woman did not give her consent to take her nude photo and then post it. Her post resulted in her facing criminal charges and she also got fired from her radio show and banned from all the LA fitness gyms across the US. In 2017, she faced the court and pleaded no contest to a charge of invasion of privacy. She was also charged $1,000 and was ordered to spend a month doing community service of removing graffiti around Los Angeles. Moving on to number eight is Lance Armstrong. While he will always be known for his success as the greatest cyclist of all time, he will also be known as an athlete who lost everything due to a doping scandal. For many years, he was supported and admired for being an incredible athlete and also a cancer survivor who inspired others. Which is why it was so shocking to fans when the US anti-doping agency announced that he was running the biggest doping program the sport has ever seen. Their statement read, he ran the most sophisticated, professionalized, and successful doping program the sport has ever seen. He later ended up admitting during an interview with Oprah that he had been taking the substance, which of course is a huge no-no in sports. He was stripped from his cycling titles and dropped by all of his sponsors, including Nike Inc. and Live Strong. On top of that, he was banned from professional cycling races altogether. He ended up reaching a $5 million settlement with the government, but his career has just never been the same since. In 2020, a documentary called Lance came out on Netflix and it does a deep dive on his career and the whole scandal. So if you want to know the deets, go watch. In spot number seven, we have Chrissy Teigen. In recent months, she has been in the biggest scandal of her career after being accused of online bullying. It all started when Courtney Sodden accused her of bullying for years on Twitter and then even shared screenshots of private messages and tweets of Chrissy saying very rude and inappropriate things. Some of the tweets are so bad, she was actually wishing death upon her and told her to take her own life. The tweets are from the past, but people were shocked to see them and couldn't believe that she would ever behave like that. Chrissy had to step down from her role in Never Have I Ever season two, where she was supposed to be the voiceover role. It was later announced that she was actually replaced with Gigi Hadid. After seeing the backlash, she publicly apologized to her fans and also Courtney, taking full responsibility for what she did. But it seems like that hasn't been enough, and even she admitted to paparazzi very recently that she could be canceled forever. She doesn't know yet. Making her way into number six, we have Paula Dean. For many years, she was the face of the Food Network, but then a lawsuit took the title away from her and her career collapsed in front of her. The chaos all started when another celebrity chef, Lisa Jackson, accused her of racial discrimination, claiming that she used the N word when talking about African Americans. Lisa was actually her former general manager, so it was crazy to see someone who was once very close to her turn against her and then reveal the truth. When Paula was asked if she has ever used the N word, her response was this, I quote, yes, of course, it's just what they are. They're jokes. Most jokes are about Jewish people, rednecks, black folks. I can't determine what offends another person. This was not the answer people were hoping for. I think most people expected an apology maybe, or for her to admit how disrespectful and wrong it was, but no, apparently it's jokes. Fox News then obtained quotes that she has said over her career where she made a variety of comments that a lot of people would find offensive. Immediately, networks canceled her TV programs worldwide and she has had to go to court to defend her case. We have made it halfway through this list and at number five, we have Jesse Smollett. His scandal took the world by storm in 2019 and is still ongoing to this day. On January 29th, 2019, a news article surfaced saying that he was in the hospital after being attacked by two men who allegedly put a rope around his neck, beat him, and then poured chemicals on him. 
The reports claimed that the attackers were yelling racial and homophobic slurs, so it was being treated as a hate crime. The media and his fans came together online to support him through what seemed to be this horrific incident. The two suspects were arrested, but in court, they revealed that it was actually all set up by Justy and showed a check that he paid them to stage the entire thing. On February 21st, he was arrested on suspicion of filing a false police report and was charged with six counts of lying to police, all of which he pleaded not guilty to. But prosecutors ended up dropping the charges, which the Chicago police were not happy with, and they argued that the actor got off scot-free. In more recent times, an investigator has been hired since then to further investigate and prosecute him, so the scandal is still not over. Rolling into spot number four is Tila Tequila. I have not heard of her in a long time. At one point in time, though, you could find her everywhere, starring on her own reality show, A Shot at Love with Tila Tequila, which ran for two successful seasons. I watched some of it. She got tons of attention on social media, but it started getting very negative when she started posting some very offensive things. One of them pushed her career over the edge in 2013 when she started praising Al and posted a rant titled, Why I Sympathize with If you think that's bad, it got even worse in 2016 when she and her friends posed for a photo saluting like a her Twitter account was suspended shortly after, and she was removed from the reality show Celebrity Big Brother. She was pretty much blacklisted in Hollywood at that point, and no one wanted to work with her for the sake of their careers. She is now a married mother of two and has a YouTube channel, which is also filled with very controversial and strange videos. Taking over our third spot is Army Hammer. 2020 was a rough year for the actor's career after some disturbing claims came out from his former girlfriends. The claim said that he was a cannibal and that he would take his disturbing BDSM fantasies too far in their intimate relationship. His one ex, Paige Lorenz, claimed he would tie her up, use a paddle, and leave her with bruises, bite her to a point of breaking the skin, and even carved his initials into her body during a kinky game. She described the situation as Fifty Shades of Grey, but without the love. Since the claims came out, his career has taken a huge hit. He was dropped from Billion Dollar Spy, and his reputation has just been severely damaged. An investigation by the LAPD was filed against him after allegations said he had sexually assaulted some women in his past. In June of 2021, just last month, he checked himself into a treatment program, and sources say it is because he could not handle everything that has been going on. Sources say he checked into an inpatient facility for substance, alcohol, and sex issues. In our number two spot is Roseanne Barr. Another time that tweets ruin someone's career, I think we can all learn something from this, maybe think before you tweet. The actress and comedian was once on top of the world with her own ABC show called Roseanne, but that all ended in May 2018. She sent out some racist tweets referring to Valerie Jarrett, who was the senior advisor to the former president, Barack Obama. In her tweet, she compared Valerie to a cross between the Muslim Brotherhood and the movie Planet of the Apes. People were immediately furious and disgusted with her words, and no one thought it was funny even though she was claiming that it was a joke. After seeing the backlash she was getting, she deleted the tweet and apologized, but ABC had already canceled her show, which was actually supposed to air that day. In interviews after that, when talking about the controversy, she still laughs it off and continues to say that it was a joke. We are at number one and we have Chris Brown. The singer forever changed his reputation and career back in 2009 when he faced felony charges. It's honestly hard to forget the horrible altercation that happened between he and his then girlfriend Rihanna when he was charged with felony assault. Photos surfaced at the time showing Rihanna's face all battered and bruised. He ended up pleading guilty to the charges and was sentenced to serve five years probation and 1,400 hours of community service. After the incident, he was very very open and honest in interviews and actually admitted to punching her in the face, calling himself a monster. His career has never been the same since, but Rihanna ended up forgiving him. She originally had a restraining order against him, of course, but she later dropped that and said that the two of them are still very close friends. Starting off our list at number 10 is Billie Eilish. She is currently the world's biggest 17 year old when it comes to stardom. The moody singer songwriter has a reputation for making unique music videos that always go viral. She first made her name known in the music scene when she came out with the surprise hit Ocean Eyes back in 2016. 
seen. And even though she is one of the world's biggest pop stars right now, she often goes against that typical pop star image that you would see. She is a fan of her own passion for the art, but she is not a fan of the fame that comes with it. She beats the norm when it comes to Hollywood standards, and she has no problem sharing her thoughts about it. During interviews, she said, Fame is horrible. It's worth it because it lets me play shows and meet people, but fame itself is effing dreadful. In another interview, she was asked what it was like taking on Hollywood at such a young age, and she replied with, There is no training. There's no like, let me go to school that's going to teach me how to be famous. Also, that would suck. That would be a trash school. Famous people suck. Fame is trash. Damn, Billy, tell us how you really feel. In at number nine is Amy Schumer. The comedian hates Hollywood so much she made a whole episode about the downfalls of fame. In one of her stand up sketches, she joked about how being famous isn't fun and that she's going to pull a Justin Bieber and stop taking pictures with fans. This wasn't for no reason though, it was after a man harassed her while asking for a photo. She also went off about what it was really like to go to the Met Gala that a lot of people dream of being invited to. During an interview on The Howard Stern Show, she confirmed confessed that going to the gala felt like, and I quote, felt like punishment. When asked about the dresses, she said, we were dressed up like a bunch of effing assholes. She explained that it feels like people doing an impression of having a conversation and that it was all very farce. Schumer even admitted to leaving the event early and said, I left, not the second I could, I left earlier than I should have been allowed. I got to meet Beyonce and she was like, is this your first gala? And I was like, it's my last. I think it's safe to say that she probably won't be invited to the next one. Swipe so our number 8 spot is Selena Gomez. Fans were shocked when she decided to cancel part of her Revival World Tour and enter treatment for depression and anxiety. She opened up to Vogue about why she checked herself into a facility in Tennessee. She said, Tours are a really lonely place for me. My self esteem was shot. I was depressed, anxious, basically I felt I wasn't good enough and wasn't capable. It's hard to believe she would feel lonely when she's constantly surrounded by millions of fans who adore her, but she said that there's so Social anxiety that comes with that. Along with fame and Hollywood comes social media, to which she has been named the most popular celebrity on Instagram, having a current total of 152 million followers. It's one part of Hollywood that she says is a love hate relationship. She blames social media for her struggles with image and mental health, but also loves the platform it gives to connect with her fans. It seems like people in Hollywood are a lot lonelier than we would think. I always thought, like, how can you be lonely when there are always people around you? But it just goes to show that it roots a lot deeper than just having people physically there. Taking over our number 7 spot is Gigi Hadid. The 23 year old is one of the biggest models on the planet and she admits that fame hasn't been the easiest thing to take on. A few months ago in April of 2019, she spoke to Variety about her career and discussed how she's dealt with Hollywood and living life in the spotlight. She even got emotional while speaking about it and said, I quote, at times fame makes you feel out of control of your life. I think it's tough. Obviously people judge you. People can create a headline or an opinion about someone based on a small moment moment or a mistake. Back in 2017, she also spoke with Harper's Bazaar where she revealed her time in Hollywood has had a huge impact on her circle of friends. She said a lot of things in friends come out when someone gets famous and that she has lost a lot of friends because of it. She did admit that in some way it's a good thing because you find out who your real friends are, but that fame plays an effect on every aspect of her life. When talking about her passion for modeling, she admits that she always knew she wanted to support herself and have the creative freedom she has now to shape her own life. It seems like she is grateful for that aspect, but just wishes things could be a little bit easier. At number 6 is Vanessa Hudgens. Her career began and took off with Disney, and she's fully admitted the struggle she has faced to shed that innocent Disney image that you get held above your head. Luckily, she's been able to continue an acting career and a successful one at that. Not only did she hate the judgement she faced when moving on from Disney, but she also hates just fame in general. During an interview, she said, I don't like the word fame. Some people like the idea of fame. I don't like the idea of fame. I like being an actress. It's different. She often tries to express the difference between wanting to be an actor and wanting to be famous. She says that people often link them together since fame just naturally comes when you are a Hollywood actor. But she once told Daily Telegraph, I became an actress and started singing and dancing because I truly loved it. I did not want to be a celebrity. I think fame is just something that comes along when you are in something that is such a success. Like other stars on this list, she hates media and paparazzi and the fact that everyone just tries to get in your business. She says that it becomes crippling. 
Halfway through our list at number five is Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen. I know they are two people, but there's no way I'm giving these twins two different spots. So they are a two for one package deal. Their fame skyrocketed in the 1990s and 2000s with their first role on the hit TV series Full House, which they were on from the time that they were literally infants. As the twins continued to grow their empire, becoming the youngest billionaires at one point in time, it was clear that they wanted to leave that Hollywood limelight. They ended up both leaving their acting careers and more recently declined to be a part of the Full House reboot. Ashley admitted that she feels uncomfortable with acting now and Mary Kate claimed that it was just awful timing for her. The two of them have been very vocal on how they hate the attention they get and they do everything they can not to be in the spotlight. During an interview with Vogue, they explained that they have chosen to stay off social media all these years. Mary Kate said, we've spent our whole lives trying to not let people have that accessibility. It's their way of avoiding the things that they dislike about Hollywood and it seems to be working pretty well for them. Taking the number four spot is Katy Perry. Perry, another star who wants success in Hollywood just without the fame. She loves creating music but is over the whole famous thing apparently. One thing the singer has strived to do is show that her life in Hollywood comes with a heavy price and sometimes people don't want to pay for it anymore, if you know what I mean. This is why she created a full length movie called Part of Me which documented her entire concert tour back in 2012. She wanted people to see what it is really like to be a pop star, the good, the bad and all the behind the scenes that actually goes into putting on those kinds of shows. When asked about her thoughts on fame, she said, I'm tired of being famous already, but I'm not tired of creating. Fame is, I think, just a disgusting byproduct of what I do. She continues to try and show her fans that she's relatable and isn't what people think all Hollywood stars are. All right, guys, at number three is Lady Gaga. The star comes across confident as hell, but she is opened up about her struggles with fame and the pain Hollywood can cause. She revealed a lot of emotions with CBS Sunday Morning and said, as soon as I go out into the world, I belong in a way to everyone else. It's legal to follow me, it's legal to stalk me at a beach, I can't call the police or ask them to leave. She got teary eyed speaking on the subject and said that she has no freedom in her everyday life but has freedom in her heart which comes out through her music. One thing she hates the most is how everyone recognizes her in public because it has completely transformed her interactions with people. She says, I miss people, I miss you know, going anywhere and meeting a random person and saying hi and having a conversation about life. I love people. I mean, what an eye opener that is. We can literally like go up to anyone on the streets and say hi, and she will literally never be able to do that ever again because she'll always be recognized as Lady Gaga. Here we are at number two with Sia. It's no surprise that Sia is in Hollywood, but really doesn't want to be. She wants to share her music with the world, but not her private life, not even her face. She's the first celebrity to cover her face at all times during interviews, red carpets, performances, literally everything. For years, very few people had actually seen her without a wig covered her face. At first the world just thought it was all part of her act, maybe part of her character as an artist, but she's been open about her reasoning and says it's everything to do with hating fame. During an interview she said, if anyone besides famous people knew what it was like to be a famous person, they would never want to be famous. I don't want to be famous or recognizable. I don't want to be critiqued about the way that I look on the internet. I've been writing pop songs for pop stars now for a couple of years and I've become friends with them and see what their life is like and that's not something I want. She was very successful at hiding her image and loved that she was able to go out and do simple things like grocery shopping. No one would even know that it was Sia because no fans or media sources actually knew what she looked like. Since then, she has showed up to a few events without a wig but still maintains a very low profile. Taking our number one spot is the adored Justin Bieber. Over the last few years, we've watched the pop star cancel his tour and walk away from his music career. Not only that, but he's also walked away from Hollywood as a whole. In September 2018, he announced that he was settling and living full time in Ontario, Canada with his new wife, Haley Baldwin. Sources say he felt that living in his home country was the right thing to do at this point in his life. This way, he doesn't feel the pressures of Hollywood and has the chance to actually have some privacy. He discussed his struggles of being in the spotlight during an NME interview saying, I'm struggling just to get through the day. You get lonely, you know, when you're on the road. People see the glam and the amazing stuff, but they don't know the other side. This life can rip you apart. He went into more details detail explaining the isolation of camping out in hotel rooms trying to avoid fans and paparazzi. Since moving to Canada, he has been able to focus on his mental health, which he says Hollywood once destroyed. Number 10, Chadwick Boseman. The late, great Chadwick Boseman was not just an incredible performer, but an incredible man. 
In his early years of acting, no matter what his status was, he was always vocal about the things that he did not agree with or understand. During a commencement speech to the graduating class of 2018 at his alma mater, Howard University, he spoke about a time when he was fired from a show for questioning the producers about the stereotypical depiction of his character. At first he was excited, as he was promised a six-figure contract, more money than he'd ever seen in his life. However, the moment he saw the role that he was playing, he was conflicted. The role was wrapped up in assumptions about people of color. He said that the character was just a young man with a violent streak pulled into the allure of gangs and with zero glimpse of positivity or talent in the character. After filming a handful of episodes, Chadwick brought his concerns to the attention of the producers who told him that they were very pleased with his performance, a performance that he was actually fired from the next day. Apparently, the things that he was asking caught the producers off guard. The conversation over the character actually came up when he was called into the production office, and they were very happy with what he'd been doing on the show, and it was clear they wanted him around for a long time. But when they asked him if he needed anything to be more comfortable, it was his opening. He asked them if they could just discuss his character a bit for plot purposes, asking them only two questions. Where is my father? And if my mother is not equipped to be a good parent, why did myself and my brother need to go to foster care? While the producers did have answers, when Chadwick asked if they felt that he was a stereotypical character at all, the producers stared for a moment before suggesting that he speak to the writers if he had any suggestions. The goal was to give his character a new lease on life, but the next day, he was fired for speaking his mind, something he's never regretted once and that never stopped him from pursuing his dreams. Number 9. Sylvester Stallone Considering the success of the Beverly Hills Cop franchise, it's difficult to imagine anyone else in the leading role of Alex Foley other than Eddie Murphy. But it turns out that at the time, the role was initially offered to one of the biggest stars of the 1980s, Sylvester Stallone. What's funny still is that at the time, he was not just a skilled actor, but earning an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay for Rocky. But it seems that Rocky and the studio didn't really agree on many things, and eventually Stallone was exited from the project. One of the first major changes in Sly's version of the script was the violence. He wanted it to be ramped up to 100 and make it a real action movie. But the film was presented to him as a comedy. Even though he agreed to do it, he wanted to make some changes before the cameras rolled. He was exclusively told not to change anything about the film, but he insisted and rewrote the project as a 50-50 action comedy movie. When he presented the changes to the producers, they were not pleased with his script, in fact quite the opposite. It was quickly decided that Sylvester would be let go as the lead and Eddie Murphy would be brought in to fill in the blanks. It was not in vain as he took that mangled script, incorporated elements of the novel Fair Game by Paula Gosling, and eventually it became the 1986 film Cobra. Although it wasn't loved by critics, it did go on to make around $160 million globally, which pretty good at the time. Number 8. Edward Norton Three-time Academy Award nominee Edward Norton has been the leading man in many memorable movies. Primal Fear, American History X, and of course the most famous one, but as we all know, but of course, one of his most famous and mainstream roles was in the 2008 MCU flick, The Incredible Hulk. Although the movie was not a massive success at first, the audience was shocked when Edward Norton was replaced by Mark Ruffalo in the first Avengers film. The president of Marvel Studios, Kevin Feige, said that the decision was not monetary, but it was actually due to the company wishing to hire an actor who embodied the creativity and collaboration that the other Marvel stars had so far shown on their projects. After Kevin made these statements, However, Norton was amicable but adamant about splitting ways with Marvel and mentioned that his roles in Birdman and Moonrise Kingdom would oppose the loud and extravagant role that he had in the MCU. Many believe that his calm response may be because he was paid handsomely before he was let go as a little bit of hush money. Marvel is good at hiding secrets, especially from their actors, but it was still so early in the MCU that Edward was certainly aware of hidden details and events that would make him a liability in the industry. Number 7. Colin Firth the live-action Paddington movies are surprisingly very popular. The series, based on the children's book, has really hit home for a lot of people. The first and second film are currently rated at 97% and 99% fresh, respectively. 99. The success of the film can of course be attributed to the incredible cast, including the voice of Paddington, Ben Wishaw. But of course, Ben was not the first voice that had been recorded for the role. Initially, the voice of Paddington was done by Kingsman star Colin Firth. I know he's been in other things, but I love those movies and that's how I know him best. Not only did Colin record all of the lines start to finish, but he was not told that he was being replaced until a couple of months before the premiere. In some of the first promotional videos for the film, the animated bear never does 
anything more than grunt. It turns out that the creative team felt Colin's voice just didn't match with the vibe that they were going for. It made Paddington sound too old and distinguished when he needed to be some fresh young thing. Yeah, he was just happy to be working. Now let's get into some more dark Hollywood backstories, shall we? Number six, Jim Carrey's origins. A Canadian legend, Jim is considered one of the greatest modern comedians of all time, famously releasing three films in the year 1995, Dumb and Dumber, The Mask, and Ace Ventura, which all made millions at the box office, and still hold up to this day. As many know, comedians tend to have a pretty rough backstory as the best comedy comes from a place of pain. Over the years, Jim has come clean about his strange but fun upbringing. His family struggled financially, and he grew up watching his mother struggle with depression, which he claims to have passed down to him. Despite his energy, he was a bit of a recluse growing up and apparently spent hours in his room making faces in the mirror instead of hanging out with him. After dropping out of high school to work a full-time job, Jim and his family were forced to live in a Volkswagen van together, becoming homeless for a short period of time. He went on to attempt a career in comedy at first to minimal success, but of course he was able to find his footing and made his place in comedy history. Number five. Woody Harrelson's father. Woody is best known in Hollywood as the wildest wild child to ever exist. He eats raw meat, he's an eco-crusader, a protester against violence, and an advocate for the legalization of herbs and spices in the United States. He's loved on screen, but did you know that his father took people out for money? And I'm not talking about on dates. Charles Harrelson was sentenced to two lifetime sentences for the first, the slaying of a federal judge in San Antonio. Prior to that charge, Charles had previously been acquitted for the slaying of Alan Berg, a carpet salesman, and convicted of the slaying of Sam DeGalia Jr. Yeah. The evidence shows that Charles was not a great Woody doesn't speak much of his father these days, opting to instead leave his family troubles in the past. He does, however, say that the one thing that his father said to him that he still uses to this day was, always keep an open mind. Yeah, Charles knew all about opening minds. You can't put that in the video, that's just for the editor. I just did. Number four, Mark Wahlberg should be in jail. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991. Despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids show, the crew had a small following and garnered a lot of success, enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted and picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark playing the leading man. Action by the numbers, kinda get it. He's had a successful acting career that has recently been declining in quality, but he's still acting and looks jacked at the age of 50-something. So please don't hurt me, Mark Wahlberg. Infinite was just hard to watch. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young, and he became addicted to no-no snow by the age of 13. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested when he was 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was just walking home late one night under the influence of a hallucinogen narcotic that I won't get into. When he spotted the men, close friends at the time confirmed that Mark had a racial biased upbringing, which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who, you know, wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them, which made contact and knocked one of them unconscious, and he was eventually released after serving only 45 days of his two-year prison sentence, and he vowed to change his life. So far, he's kept that promise. I can personally confirm that he's very polite and patient, because he actually watched a movie at a theater I used to work at. He travels with a crew of five people at all times. It's a little intimidating. Number three, Tim Allen's hobbies. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear and the star of ABC's sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. Now, while he may have played a family man on TV, many fans may not know that Tim was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a couple of bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport, that's an awesome name, and was caught with more than 650 grams, 1.4 pounds of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 or more, like, as he was being arrested, there was a guy in his car like, okay, and if you have six, how many? 650 grams. Okay, yeah, you're a goner, Tim. However, that sentence was never served, as it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state one, being able to ignore that new policy altogether. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. That needs to be a movie. 
Number two, they have backups. There have been many rumors over the years that Hollywood likes to clone their best and brightest on the off chance that they will need them again following an untimely demise. According to the internet, Paul Rudd actually got to star alongside his clone in the show Living With Yourself, not some CGI thing. Now, Paul has, of course, claimed the performance was achieved with CGI and filming one character one day and another the next, but come on, Paul Rudd's also 54 and looks, well, like that. Something's not right about that. Now, there is a theory out there that celebrities are made up of lizard people who take the forms of actors and singers to influence people. Paul is thought to be one of those lizard people. I don't know. I don't believe this theory. I'm just sharing some stuff I found on the internet. Just, I don't believe any of this, okay? I'm just, this is fun. It would be awesome if there were two Paul Rudds though. In fact, that would probably be the most chill way to find out that clones existed. Just two Pauls being like, hi, I'm Paul. And another one being like, hi, I'm Paul. And everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> Number one, they're all broke. That's right, despite it being one of the most lucrative industries in the world, most of Hollywood actors, writers, directors, all of them are not as well off as people may think. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last little bit, most of Hollywood was closed for a while as its staff were on strike. Some of the toppest of tier actors joined the crew in solidarity and they are actually still on strike right now. Not stopping until Hollywood's producers and big budget studios start sharing the money they make. Actor Sean Gunn gave an interview a few weeks ago where he mentioned working on a show currently streaming on Netflix, a show that has made over $4 million in residuals of which he has received basically nothing. This type of financial woe extends to a ton of people in Hollywood. Just wanted to take a moment to wish luck to anyone who's still out there and hey, awesome that the writer part of the strike is over. That's pretty sick. Born Billie Eilish pirate Baird O'Connell on December 18, 2001, she is an American singer and songwriter who has hit the big leagues at just the young age of 17. However, her following began long before. She gained a notable following in 2016 when she released her single Ocean Eyes on SoundCloud and subsequently released on the records labels Dark Room and Interscope Records. Now, her early life consisted of homeschooling, during which time she joined the LA Children's Chorus at the age of eight. Just a few short years later, she would begin writing songs, taking after her elder brother, Phineas O'Connell, who was already writing, performing and producing his own songs with his band. More interesting still, Billy's song Ocean Eyes was actually written by Phineas for his own band. Don't know about you, but I wouldn't be too happy about that. Now, here's where things begin to get fishy. Phineas is dating YouTuber Claudia Saluski, who looks a whole lot like Billie Eilish, which has led some fans to believe that Phineas is dating Claudia simply because she looks like his sister. especially considering how oddly close him and Billy are. Anyway, I digress. Back to Ocean Eyes. The song was released as Billy's debut single back in 2016, and the song was certified platinum not long after, peaking at number 84 on the Billboard Hot 100 in May 2019. That very same year, Billy also released the single Six Feet Under, which didn't do as well, but was still a success for the rising star. Following the huge success of Ocean Eyes, Billy released the single Belly Ache on February 24, 2017, with the single Boy coming shortly after, which was used as part of the soundtrack to the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. However, her rise from the ashes came in 2018, arguably her biggest year along with 2019, which saw the singer embark on the Where's My Mind tour, as well as the release of her vinyl featuring an acoustic version of her song Party Favor, as well as a cover of Drake's Hotline Bling. Now in 2019, When We All Fall Asleep, Where Do We Go was finally released on March 29, 2019, with the album debuting at number one on the Billboard 200, as well as on the UK albums chart, in turn making Billy the first artist born in the 2000s to have a number one album in the United States and the youngest female ever to have a number one album in the United Kingdom. Bold flex, big moves. Nothing but respect for my queen. However, her biggest flex would come when her fifth single, Bad Guy, was released in conjunction with her album, and it peaked at number one in the US, in turn ending Lil Nas X record breaking 19 weeks at number one with Old Town Road. She is also the youngest artist to perform at Coachella, surpassing Lord. Now, outside of music, Billie has a massive public image with constant media attention that tends to mostly focus on her fashion style, which consists primarily of baggy, ill fitting clothing, very Adam Sandler-esque. Back in 2017, Billie actually addressed the attention surrounding her style choices, saying that she likes dressing out of her comfort zone to feel like she grabs the attention of everyone around her. However, in 2019, Billie also appeared in a Calvin Klein ad, wherein she mentioned that she dresses in baggy clothes in order to prevent people from body shaming her. I respect that so much. Now, in her personal life, Billie has stated that she actually has Tourette's syndrome, which is a common neurodevelopment disorder characterized by multiple motor tics and at least one vocal tic. She also has synesthesia in which people 
people associate colours with numbers, even music. Billie also has previously stated that she was raised vegetarian and is a big advocate for veganism on social media. Now let's jump into the meat of this video, why we're all here. The scary theory surrounding this artist, as we know every now and then a conspiracy theory pops up that just refuses to go away. This is one of those. The Illuminati is one of the biggest theories around, with many believing that the world's most powerful people secretly control the world. Ridiculous right? Well, according to some theorists, the latest member of the society is none other than Billie Eilish. Now this is entirely based on the imagery used in Billie's music video, All the Good Girls Go to Hell, which strongly features apocalyptic type imagery. And ever since its release, fans have taken to Twitter to discuss how convinced they are that Billie is in the Illuminati. I quote, So Billie Eilish single handedly brought the Illuminati back in 2019. And she's in the Illuminati, there's no point kicking off about it because it ain't gonna change anything. And Billie Eilish is the new face of the Illuminati, I guess. I guess. However, other folks went in a different direction with the theories, with one person stating, I quote, All good girls go to hell and bury a friend feature satanic messages. On Reddit, people have come up with their own theories as well, specifically about how Billy may be involved with the Illuminati. Now, this theory is utterly twisted, with the theorist stating that Billy may have indirectly killed late rapper XXS Tentacion, which thereby influenced the song Bury a Friend. The theory also says that in order to gain entry into the secret society, the candidate has to kill someone. Someone. So there we go. At the end of the day, it seems like these rumors are simply that rumors, and that Billy is likely not a part of the Illuminati. At least I don't think so, anyway. After all, if the group really did exist and she actually was a member, would she make it so obvious? Starting off this countdown, we have Meg Ryan, Dennis Quaid, and Russell Crowe. Meg Ryan was married to Dennis Quaid for nine years until she decided to cheat on him with Russell Crowe. This happened while filming the movie Proof of Life with Russell in Ecuador. Somehow, news got out about Ryan and Crow, and Quaid soon filed for divorce. But Ryan turned it around, saying that the divorce was all Quaid's fault, and that he had also been unfaithful during their marriage. In the end, Ryan lost Crow and Quaid, and the movie tanked in the box office. So maybe that's karma. Moving on to number nine, we have Aaron Carter, Hilary Duff, and Lindsay Lohan. Back in the early 2000s, Aaron Carter was quite the heartthrob and ladies' man, catching the the hearts of fans and celebrities all around the world. Well, Aaron met Hillary when he guest starred in the Lizzie McGuire Christmas special. If you guys remember that, smash that like button, because I do. Then on his 13th birthday, the pair officially began dating. They were together for almost two years when he cheated on her with Lindsay Lohan. In fact, he was two timing her. So he was dating Lindsay and Hillary at the same time. Now, this is what Aaron had to say. I started dating Hillary on my 13th birthday. I was dating her for like a year and a half, and then I just got a little bored. So I went and I started getting to know Lindsay, dating Lindsay. Then I didn't want to do that anymore, so I got back with Hillary. And then I ended up cheating on Hillary with her best friend. That's nothing to smile about. She wasn't even that good looking either. End of quote. I didn't just add that in. He also said that. So he literally got bored and was like, sure, let's fool around with other women. She's Aaron. In our 8th spot today we have Laura Dern, Billy Bob Thornton, and Angelina Jolie. Honestly, people might hate me for saying this, but Billy Bob Thornton and Angelina Jolie were a hot couple. I'm sorry. Well, Laura Dern and Billy Bob started dating in 1997 while on the set of Ellen. The couple dated for three years and even were engaged. But in 1999, he called it quits, and a year later, he married Angelina Jolie. That one's gotta hurt. According to Dern, she said, and I quote, I left our home to work on a movie, and while I was away, my boyfriend got married, and I've never heard from him again. That is very harsh. Moving on to number seven, we have Alex Rodriguez, Kate Hudson, and Cameron Diaz. Now, this dude has dated all the stars, I swear, like Madonna, JLo, come on now. Anyways, Kate Hudson and A Rod dated for seven months before calling it quits in December of 2009. Just a few months later, Cameron Diaz was seen leaving his house with overnight bags. You guys know what that means. And according to sources, Hudson was not happy with this at all. Maybe this was payback for Hudson hooking up with Cameron's ex-boyfriend Justin Timberlake shortly after they broke up. Who knows? But in 2012, it seems like they got over this drama because they were quite chummy with each other at the Academy Awards. In 2013, Diaz referred to Hudson as one of her good friends. 
We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with Sophia Bush, Chad Michael Murray, and Paris Hilton. Now, Chad Michael Murray is one fine man, okay? Let me just say that. And I did not know that he got together with Paris Hilton. Okay, I don't know, I just can't picture them together, you know? But I guess opposites attract. One Tree Hill stars Sophia and Chad ended up having chemistry on and off screen. In December of 2005, they actually got married. But the marriage was very short lived. Five months later, they separated. And apparently, Chad was spotted with Paris Hilton. Now, this is where it gets messy. So at the time the two allegedly got together, Paris was dating Nick Carter. Nick's younger brother, Aaron Carter, eventually spilled the tea, saying that Paris cheated on his brother with Chad Michael Murray. So they both cheated on their partners. A year later, Sophia and Chad filed for divorce. In our fourth spot, we have Kristen Stewart, Robert Pattinson, and Rupert Sanders. Now, I don't know if you remember when this drama came out, but I do. And that's because I was a hardcore Twilight fan, and I shipped Kristen and Robert to the moon and back. When I heard she cheated on him, I was so mad at her. Like, she didn't even know who I was, but I was mad. Anyways, while filming Snow White and the Huntsman, Kristen got with the director, Rupert Sanders, and the two were caught kissing and public. Kristen was dating Robert at the time, and Rupert was married to Liberty Ross. Rob and Kristen separated for a bit, then got back together again, only to break up again in 2013. Whereas Rupert's wife filed for divorce in 2013. In our third spot today, we have David Spade, Laura Flynn Boyle, and Jack Nicholson. This is a very odd trio, but apparently Jack Nicholson stole David Spade's girlfriend, Laura Flynn Boyle, from him in 1999. According to him, that's what happened. They had been dating for a year when Jack literally asked her out in front of David. Now, David got all defensive being like, I know you're gonna go out with him anyway. And she was like, no way, he's worse than Trump. Like, no lie, that's what she said. But in the end, the two were spotted together. Actually, they got in a car crash together and apparently Boyle climbed out of the sunroof and yelled, I have a boyfriend, I can't be here. But she was caught, like literally red-handed. In our third spot today, we have Bella Thorne, her brother, and another Bella. Bella Thorne's brother, Remy Thorne, was dating a girl named Bella Pendergast for three years. The pair broke up around 2015. Bella Thorne was dating Greg Sulkin, and when she broke up, she quickly came out as bisexual on her Twitter. A little while later, she was spotted with her brother's ex being a little too close. They shared a number of photos holding hands and kissing. And people were like, is she seriously dating her brother's ex? And yes, the answer is yes, she did. But shortly after, Bella Thorne decided to go after Greg Sulkin's friend, Tyler Posey. Then a month later, she dumped him and was with Charlie Puth. And don't get me started with the whole Tana Modson relationship, okay? That's a whole other mess on its own. And in our number one spot today, we have Olivia Wilde, Jason Sudeikis, and Harry Styles. Now, I must be living under a bus because I love Jason Sudeikis, but I did not know that he was engaged to Olivia Wilde. The pair first met in 2011 and began dating a few months later. In 2012, they got engaged. And in 2014 and 2016, they gave birth to two children. But in 2020, the pair announced that they had split. A few months later, Olivia was spotted with Harry Styles after attending a wedding together. They both met during the movie Don't Worry Darling, and some believe that Styles might be one of the reasons as to why the two split. One source said, and I quote, Olivia called off the engagement in early November, but only after she had already gotten close to Harry. The source continued on saying, whether Harry knows it or not, he was the reason for the split, and it blindsided Jason. Number 10, Lindsay Lohan. In the early 2000s, Lindsay Lohan faced a ton of public scandals, but one that's not talked about often enough actually took place behind the scenes of a little show called Ugly Betty. Lohan was a guest star on the show in the third season playing Kimmy Keegan. Kimmy was supposed to stick around for six total episodes, but that number was shrunken down to just four. The reason being was her co-star and, you know, the lead of the show, America Ferreira, just didn't get along with Lindsay on set. According to America and several of the Ugly Betty crew members, Lindsay would just show up with an entourage of people, usually under the influence of herbs and spices, and the production crew had to repaint her dressing room when she left because it was just so messed up. One crew member alleged that she would cut images of her own face out of magazines and tabloid articles as if she were making a collage of some kind. America claims that one scene took over 30 takes to get right because they just kept flubbing 
telling their lines. Lindsay's team of buddies have been adamant that America had too much power and was the sole reason that she was asked to leave the show. Unfortunately, if you do bad things, and enough people know about it, karma comes around. Number nine, Julianne Moore. Ah, creative differences. The phrase that has been behind some of the most tragic Hollywood stories in films that could have been, and in this case, roles. For an industry centered around creativity, the movie industry can be awfully risk averse, especially when it comes to the decision of casting a lead. Now, it's not uncommon for actors to suddenly be thrust out of productions in lieu of a new face, or in some cases, the original choice that you were replacing. A good example of doing it yourself, though, is Julianne Moore, the actor from films like the 2013 reboot of Carrie and the action flick Kingsman Golden Circle, was set to play the leading lady in the critically acclaimed dramedy Can You Ever Forgive Me? And she was casted as the character Lee Israel, a writer who falls out of step with current culture and decides to embellish her writing, basically inventing the concept of fake news. Julianne began filming her scenes, but was asked to leave the production only one month into filming. According to the director, Nicole Hollifner, portrayal of her character just wasn't what she had in mind while writing. Julianne played the role with too much of herself influencing the overall appeal. When directed to try to play the role another way, Julianne continued to give a similar performance, and she was ultimately replaced by Melissa McCarthy. Better known for her more comedic roles in movies like The Heat and Bridesmaids, but her turn as Lee is considered to be one of her greatest acting achievements of all time, even landing her a nomination for Best Actress at the 2019 Oscar ceremony. Julianne didn't take the news all that well, but did eventually move on and has made a couple of solid flicks since, so eh, it all worked out in the end for everybody. Number eight. Henry Winkler. Henry Winkler is best known for his role as the Fonz on Happy Days, and he was set to direct Tom Hanks in the much-loved buddy cop movie, Turner and Hooch. Unfortunately, these two had a pretty rough history together before that. The Fonz had actually fought with Hanks in character on the set of Happy Days for an episode a few years before, and it would appear that Tom wishes that he could fight Henry for real. As rumor has it, the two of them just didn't get along at all, so much so that a few days into filming Turner and Hooch with Henry behind the wheel, Tom Tom ordered Winkler to be removed from the set and replaced as director. That's the kind of power Tom Hanks wields. He can just walk on set and be like, no. Not only did Tom complain that Henry's behavior as director was annoying, he complained that Henry was just overall bad at his job. It would take double the average time to reset a shot on set, he had minimal control over his actors, and he was apparently very frustrated with having a dog on the set. Like, did he even read the script before he took the job? That dog is a national treasure. What makes this firing even more tragic is the fact that when Winkler was delivered the news, one of the film's producers ripped Henry's contract up in front of his face. Over the years, when asked about the incident, Henry denies that he's ever had any kind of personal or professional issues with Tom Hanks. Tom's never given us any reason to think that he would lie about something like that. What would he have to gain? Huh? I defeated the Fonz. Hey, so did ABC when they canceled his show. Number seven, Jean-Claude Van Damme. The Belgian actor Jean-Claude Van Damme was just on the verge of coming into his own career as the muscles from Brussels when he landed a job opposite of Arnold Schwarzenegger in 1987's action flick, Predator. Now, this sounded like the perfect casting choice, right? Jean would have worked alongside the likes of Carl Weathers and Jesse Ventura. And while that may have turned out cool, the reality was that Jean wasn't casted to play a role as one of the Marines at all. Instead, he was casted to play the titular Predator himself. The special effects artist behind the project called the experience with Jean as a hilarious comedy of errors, in which nobody knew exactly what the other was expecting. Apparently, nobody had informed Jean that the role was basically just a glorified stuntman. They were prepared to direct him to just hop around like a frog, but John was obviously confused and upset with this choice. According to John, he had just gotten off the boat, and he was under the impression that he was going to be showcasing his martial arts skills to the world, but was instead reduced to a massive, slow-moving alien with dreadlocks. To the surprise of absolutely nobody, Van Damme was furious and dispirited about spending this entire movie coked up in a clunky and often ridiculous-looking suit, and was ultimately fired and replaced with Kevin Peter Hall. The idea that he was just on set like, I can barely move in this thing, just brings me so much joy. Number six, Shia LaBeouf. In 2013, Alec Baldwin was attached to star in a Broadway production of the show Orphans alongside Transformers alumni Shia LaBeouf. Now from day one of rehearsal, Shia and Baldwin were at each other's throats. Shia's problem was that Alec was not off script. This was something that he considered to be very unprofessional. Shia has since claimed that he was so nervous about the show that he made sure to memorize his lines before he even set foot on the stage. His method 
methods were not reciprocated by Alec, who simply showed up with a coffee in one hand and a script in the other one, planning to rehearse in the moment. Shia was furious and apparently yelled at Alec to learn his lines right now. He was the lead, that's the deal. After a couple of weeks and one particularly rough day where Shia blew up at him in front of a ton of cast and crew, Alec took five and had a meeting with the producers. He said that if Shia wasn't let go, that he was gonna quit. Well, producers caved and Shia was let go. In the tabloid, they claim creative differences, but Shia later shared his side, clearly upset with being dropped as if he meant nothing to the show. Number five, Dennis Hopper. Dennis Hopper is one of the groundbreaking actors and directors of the 1960s and 70s, New Hollywood, now eventually finding his niche in the early 90s, playing villains in films like Speed, Waterworld, and the live action Mario movie where he plays Bowser. Yes, that exists. No, it's not good. So it came as no surprise when he was casted to play Kristoff, the all powerful TV producer controlling Truman Burbank's life in the film, The Truman Show. The cast was stacked and it included Hollywood heavyweight Jim Carrey as the titular Truman. Anyone with a brain cell would have been excited to be a part of this movie, still considered to be one of Jim's best dramatic performances. However, two days into filming his scenes for Kristoff, which were only supposed to take 10 days to film, Hopper was unceremoniously let go from the set. Apparently, Dennis had a contract in place with producer Scott Rudden that he would be fired should his work be unsatisfactory. He must have been pretty bad in the role as the director Peter Weir has been described as extremely reluctant to ever remove an actor from a movie. Reports later surfaced that Hopper was basically half asleep while playing the character, and while Kristoff wasn't written to be, you know, a manic madman, he did require just a little bit of effort to be properly portrayed. Ultimately, Ed Harris stepped in to play the role after production had been desperately trying to replace Dennis to avoid having this film be shut down entirely. Thankfully, that never happened, and The Truman Show has gone on to be one of the most depressingly heartfelt films Jim Carrey has ever made. Oh, and Ed actually got nominated for an Oscar, so sorry, Dennis, looks like they made a good move. Number four, Eric Stoltz. All right, here, let's talk about a little bit of the 1985 comedy sci-fi Back to the Future. I loved this movie growing up. The story followed Marty McFly, a high school student who's accidentally sent back to 1955 in a DeLorean invented by his close friend and scientist Dr. Emmett Brown, played by Christopher Lloyd. And no, we're not going to talk about that friendship, even though it's a little strange. And they're forced to get his future parents together before he disappears from existence. Now, whoever pitched this movie must have been lacking some sleep. The film went on to spawn two sequels, creating what's considered to be one of the greatest film trilogies of all time. And while Michael J. Fox may have played the iconic Marty McFly, he actually wasn't the first actor to put on that puffy vest. A young man named Eric Stoltz was initially casted to play the role. You may not recognize Eric because his most famous character was drenched in prosthetics and makeup, playing the character of Roy L. Dennis in the film Mask, a man with severe facial and skull deformities. He was nearly halfway through shooting this movie when the news came that he was going to be replaced by Michael J. Fox. Fox was the director Robert Zemeckis' first choice, but he was initially unable to sign on to the project because of his prior commitments to the show Family Ties. Eventually, though, the two studios were able to find a way to make it work and allowed him to film both projects. This is why you may notice that a majority of Marty's scenes that take place outside are at night, because it was the only time that he could film for like 60% of this movie. Robert wanted Eric out from the very beginning, though, because his portrayal of the character was just too intense, a lot more intense than the writers had in mind, not to mention Eric read the end of the movie as a tragedy instead of a happy ending. Uh, spoiler alert for a movie that's like, 40 years old. Uh, at the end of the first film, Marty returns to 1985 after successfully getting his parents together, but instead of being poor and depressed, the family is thriving and successful, and somehow Eric took that as Marty being an outsider in a world he didn't know. But just like, look at the truck he has parked in his garage! Like, nothing tragic about that! His intensity, combined with his depressing performance of the finale, got him kicked off of the film only minutes after Fox was available. Number three, Alyssa Milano. Alright, let's talk about the show Charmed, a solid series that was on the air for 10 years. The series followed three sisters that discover they are descendants of a line of good female witches and are destined to fight against the forces of evil. Yeah, it was a fun show. However, just because you play sisters on set doesn't mean that you're going to be close in real life. Rose McGowan and Alyssa Milano had a very public altercation that resulted in a little incident on set being shared with the world. Rose claimed that Alyssa threw a fit in front of the crew, yelling that they didn't pay her enough to do the thing she was doing, only she didn't say thing she was doing. She said a bad word. She called Alyssa 
Alyssa's behavior appalling, claiming that she cried every time the show got renewed for another season because it meant more time on a toxic set. Alyssa never shared her own comments on the situation and was eventually let go from the show, confirming what she was being accused of. Number two, Thomas Gibson. Thomas made a name for himself, starring as one of the leads of the series Criminal Minds. He was on the show for a few years, and in that time, he made a few problems for the people unfortunate enough to be staff members of the series. There were a few issues over the years that would have warranted some action, like screaming at producers and writers for not doing a good job, but the incident that got him kicked off the show for good involved a kick. In 2016, Thomas was swiftly fired from the series after an incident with a writer named Virgil Williams. An internal investigation revealed that Thomas kicked Virgil one day during production of an episode that Gibson was directing. Now, as I've said before, that was not the first incident on set that really should have resulted in some kind of punishment. In 2013, he pleaded no contest to no-no juice related reckless driving after being arrested under a DUI. And three years before that, he allegedly shoved an assistant director, Ian Wolf, during a late night location scene. That led to the studio ordering Gibson to take eight hours of anger management, which clearly worked out. According to most of the people on set though, Thomas was a wild card. Some days he'd be friendly and accommodating, and the next, nuts. And at number one, Richard Gere. Richard Gere is one of those actors that doesn't really act. You know, sometimes people just get hired for films because they have a face for it or a style. For Richard Gere, he did not have enough class and moxie to keep a handle on his role in the film The Lords of the Flatbush. Now, he was cast to star alongside Rocky Balboa, Sylvester Stallone, and according to Sly, these two just didn't get along. Their beef was strong and long-lasting throughout production until it finally came to a head when one day, Richard was just a little bit too into one scene and grabbed Sylvester aggressively by his collar. When Sly told him to lay off, he laid in instead. Now, the scene was being filmed on Coney Island, and when the actors took a minute to take a break, they tried to break each other. Sly was eating a hot dog alone in his car. Sounds peaceful, right? Well, then suddenly Richard came in and joined him with half of a chicken dripping in mustard. Despite Sly's warning about the mustard, it dripped all over his pants, and in true Rocky fashion, he elbowed Richard in the face and threw him out of his car. The altercation resulted in Richard being fired from the project. Oh no! We have to decide between Richard Gere and Sylvester Stallone. I wonder how quick that decision was. Conor McGregor, a name that lit up the world of combat sports like a firework. McGregor was divisive, no question about it, but love him or hate him, his ascent was nothing short of spectacular. The spotlight shone so bright it led him straight to a blockbuster bout with none other than Floyd Mayweather. The buildup was classic, Conor's verbal sparring match where no punches were pulled. But as the bout drew closer, something shifted. The sharp wit that had catapulted McGregor to stardom seemed to dim. When he finally stepped into the ring with Mayweather, it wasn't just a fight, it was the end of an era. Mayweather shattered the invincible image Connor had crafted. The climactic showdown with Khabib was more than a fight, and McGregor returned not to the cheer of charm, but to the echoes of animosity. The exhibition was striking, yet it peeled back the layers we hadn't seen before. That night, humiliation was served cold, and the world watched as the notorious icon spiraled into chaos. He got humiliated badly and everything went wild. Before the era of social media dominated headlines, one female star shone the brightest on the world stage, Whitney Houston. She wasn't just a celebrated singer, she was an icon holding an incredible record for seven straight number one hits on the Billboard Top 100. With over 200 million records sold and notching up 28 Guinness World Records, Whitney was, without question, a musical juggernaut. The only the other star who could match her level of fame was the legendary Michael Jackson, but from 2000 to 2005, Whitney's life took a tragic turn. Her tumultuous marriage to Bobby Brown, a harrowing struggle with addiction, and the chaos of her reality TV show wreaked havoc on her illustrious career. And despite a valiant attempt to rise again with a world tour in 2009 to 2010, audiences witnessed a starkly different Whitney. The once undeniably flawless voice struggled to reach high notes. The range had dimmed, and numerous performances, including a particularly infamous one in Australia, were marred by delays and vocal issues. Disappointment filled the air as many shows plummeted into disarray, leading to an overwhelming consensus that her comeback tour was unsuccessful. Despite further attempts to regain her status, Whitney never reclaimed the once effortless pinnacle of her career. Her precipitous decline remains one of the most poignant examples of a superstar's fall from grace in the music industry.
industry. Aaron Hernandez, a former tight end for the New England Patriots, stood at the precipice of a gleaming career in the NFL. Flush with success, he was newly signed to a promising contract, his future in the league all but assured. Tragically, a series of life-altering decisions led him down a dark path that shocked the nation. Hernandez was convicted of ending the life of his friend and in the midst of attempting to overturn his sentence, he ultimately took his own life. The shadowy tale of a star fallen from grace is a stark reminder of how quickly a life can unravel, leaving more questions than answers in its wake. Aaron's story is not an isolated incident. Many other professional athletes have experienced similar downward spirals due to a variety of factors such as fame, pressure to perform, and personal struggles. Next up, Kurt Cobain. For a short period, Nirvana rose to immense fame, becoming one of the most significant rock bands globally. However, Kurt struggled with the spotlight and grappled with personal battles, including substance abuse. Nirvana's 92 Reading Festival appearance is etched in history as one of rock's finest live shows. In Utero, released in early 93, soared to the top despite being initially deemed non-viable by the label and facing backlash from retailers over controversial content. Their raw and haunting MTV Unplugged performance in November 93 was uncertain until the very last due to Cobain's dependency struggles. Sadly, in March 94, after a purposeful overdose and a fleeting stint in rehab, Cobain's life ended tragically. Despite its brief existence less than seven years with a limited discography, including major labels, albums, the band's impact was seismic, selling over 75 million records. It's a stark tale of rapid ascension against a dark downward spiral. Amanda Bynes, once the quintessential girl next door with a sparkling presence in numerous teen movies, faced a tumultuous journey that led her from the pinnacle of Hollywood success to personal struggles with addiction and a highly publicized conservatorship. Her story is one that reflects both the pressures of fame and the resilience it takes to confront personal demons under the relentless scrutiny of the public eye. Amanda Bynes rose to stardom at a young age with her breakout role on the sketch comedy show All That and later starring in her own hit sitcom, The Amanda Show. She quickly became known for her comedic talent and charm, captivating audiences with her infectious energy. Her success only continued to grow as she landed leading roles in popular films such as What a Girl Wants and She's the Man. But as her star continued to rise, so did the pressure and expectations placed upon her. In 2010, Bynes announced her retirement from acting at just 24 years old, citing a desire to pursue fashion design instead. However, that decision was met with skepticism and criticism from the media and fans alike who viewed it as a sign of her unraveling mental state. Next, we're dissecting the extraordinary fall from grace of a once revered icon, O.J. Simpson. It was a downfall that truly blindsided the public. Once celebrated as an exceptional athlete, O.J. Simpson's transition to a life overshadowed by legal controversies took the world aback. But beyond the spotlight and brand deals, there lay a turbulent story waiting to unravel. This infamous trial shed light on the flaws within the criminal justice system and raised questions about privilege and celebrity status. The O.J. Simpson case opened up discussion Discussions about wealth, power, and the influence of public perception on the outcome of a trial. But beyond the legal proceedings and media frenzy, there are also personal tragedies at play in OJ's story. From his tumultuous marriage to Nicole Brown Simpson to his strained relationship with his children, we gained a deeper understanding of the impact that fame and success can have on one's personal life. Moving on, we delve into the tumultuous narrative of Charlie Sheen's career, a high profile figure whose descent in Hollywood serves as a cautionary tale. Despite being a top earning actor on the hit TV show Two and a Half Men, Sheen's public persona took a nosedive amid personal turmoil and widely publicized controversy. Throughout his career, Sheen has been known for his charismatic and rebellious attitude, often playing similar characters on screen. However, it was his off screen behavior that truly caught the attention of the public. In 2011, Sheen's erratic behavior became a topic of concern and speculation after a series of bizarre interviews and outbursts. He notably coined phrases such as winning and tiger blood, which became a viral sensation. As the media frenzy surrounding Sheen's behavior continued, his personal life also came under scrutiny. He had a history of substance and alcohol abuse as well as tumultuous relationships. In 2010, he was arrested for domestic violence against his then wife, Brooke Mueller. While we have all witnessed 
witnessed a multitude of surprising events at award shows over the years, few could have forecasted the incident involving Will Smith and Chris Rock at the Oscars. The altercation not only sent shockwaves throughout Hollywood, but also initiated a cascade of repercussions for Smith's career. The notorious slap seen around the world instantly transformed the public's perception of Will Smith from a beloved actor to a figure of controversy. The ramifications were swift, with projects put on hold and endorsements under threat as the industry grappled with the implications of his actions. The video footage of the incident spread like wildfire on social media and news outlets, leaving many shocked and outraged. The backlash was immediate, with fans expressing their disappointment and disbelief in the actor's behavior. The incident was a stark contrast to Will Smith. Smith's image as a family friendly, charismatic, and well respected figure in Hollywood. What drives a man who's already in the limelight to yearn for even more? For Jesse Smollett, it seems it wasn't enough to be famous. He aimed to be an icon, a beacon in the fight against racism. His persistent assertion that he's still the victim as he faced his jail sentence paints a picture of someone who truly believes they've transcended fame and become a symbol through their actions. Despite being well known and successful in his career, Smollett's actions have caused a significant amount of backlash and scrutiny from the public. Many questions arise as to what drove him to allegedly stage a hate crime against himself. Perhaps it was the desire for even more fame and attention, or maybe it was a desperate attempt to elevate himself as a symbol in the fight against racism. Regardless of his motives, Smollett's behavior raises important discussions about privilege, responsibility, and the dangers of seeking validation through victimhood. And last but not least, Britney Spears. Tragically, Britney found herself in a legal tangle that left her at a severe disadvantage, almost akin to being trapped by an antiquated system. For years, she navigated through a court-sanctioned conservatorship that essentially placed her under her father's control, stripping her of autonomy until its very recent termination. The hashtag Free Britney movement has sparked a conversation about the issue of conservatorships and their implications on an individual's life. While these legal arrangements are meant to protect individuals who are unable to make decisions for themselves due to physical or mental incapacity, they can also be abused and used as a means of control. In the case of Britney, her conservatorship was put in place following a series of public breakdowns and mental health struggles. However, many have argued that she was unfairly placed under the control of her father, who allegedly used the arrangement to not only manage her finances, but also restrict her personal life and career choices. The Smith family has been in major gossip sources almost every month for the past three years. It seems as though they may never catch a break, but more importantly, it seems like we, the gossip people will never run out of content and anecdotes. Jumping right in, we have their separation. Jada recently revealed that the pair, who everyone assumed was still unhappily married, have actually been separated for years. And everything that has happened between the two since 2016 has all occurred when they were not in an official relationship. And wow, a lot has happened. The separation was revealed alongside a myriad of other strange confessions and was followed by some even crazy your revelations, which we will get into. The two say that they have always loved each other very deeply and that they always will, even going so far as to say that they are not planning to divorce, but they wanted to officially separate and provide each other space, which brings us to our next point. Up next is the revelation that Jada and Will were in an open marriage. I mean, this comes as no surprise to anyone, right? Like, come on. Now, a couple years back, this was all anyone was talking about, how Will Smith and Jada were in an open relationship but only Jada was partaking openly, and by that I mean in the public eye. The man that Jada had begun a relationship with actually moved into the house with the happy husband and wife. This arrangement definitely created an even more tense environment for the group of them, and I can't imagine having to live with that. I mean, my parents split up earlier this year, and living with them even for one month while things got packed up was a pretty awkward and tense experience. Thinking of one of them inviting their partner to come live with us? Yeah, I'd press pause on that one. Some secrets should not come out like Jada's hesitation to marry and the emotional reaction that she had on her wedding day. Jada and Will got married when they were very young, and it was actually Jada's mother who pressured her into the marriage because she really liked Will and saw a lot of potential in him. However, that decision aged poorly, obviously. For Will's birthday, she posted a fairly old photo of them with their two kids and one of Jada's sons from her previous relationship. Many fans sent birthday wishes, but there were a few, a good amount, who made snarky remarks and rehashed 
attached lines from Red Table Talks, contradicting the photo in the post. Some people commented on how she didn't love him romantically, and a clip came up of her saying how she cried all the way down the aisle because she did not want to be married to him, and how she felt pressured to be wed even though she never wanted to get married. Next up, we have the bonus son. Well, many know of the existence of Jaden and Willow Smith, not a lot know about the existence of the third son. Trey Smith was the product of Will's previous marriage to Cherie Zampino and tends to fly under the radar in the eye of the media. In 2018, Jada brought Zampino on her show and spilled the tea on the real story behind Trey, their relationship to each other and Will's role as his biological father. For many Smith fans, this is the first time anyone had even heard about Trey. Will claims that he had to distance himself from Trey and his mother following the divorce. Will recounts struggling to maintain a healthy enough relationship with Zampino for him to play the role of Trey's father figure. Trey was raised by his mom alone, growing up feeling betrayed and abandoned by Will. Eventually, Will made amends and became a proper part of Trey's life, but for a long time, Trey was kept hidden from the public, surely leaving a stain on the family unit that can never be washed away. Next up, Complex Grandpa. This one is really dark. Like, okay, kind of in a funny way, because it's not actually dark. I guess like the dark thing didn't happen, but no, it's pretty. It's pretty. No, it's pretty dark. Will Smith released a memoir called Will in 2021 that was chock full of info that you would have to waterboard out of me or pay me a huge sum of money. Okay, yeah, I, I, I get it. Will proceed. The actor explains that while he was growing up, his father physically harmed himself and his mom on continuous and frequent occasions. So, in return for this treatment, he vowed to seek revenge for his mother when he was older and capable of more. Eventually, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Will was forced to care for him while he was bedridden. Will saw this as the perfect opportunity to take his dad down. He wrote, One night, as I delicately wheeled him from his bedroom toward the bathroom, a darkness arose within me. He then went on to describe the moment he contemplated pushing him down the stairs. He noted that no one would have suspected him and the moment was just perfect. He wrote, I'm one of the best actors in the world. My 911 one call would be Academy Award level. Will ultimately decided not to end his father's life, instead taking care of him until his passing in 2016. Of natural causes, I think. Next is dating pre-slapgate. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jada Pinkett Smith has revealed a ton, a ton of information once thought to just be rumors. Well, we've already covered the fact that she has been separated from Will Smith for a while now, another fun piece of information has also been revealed. I don't know if it's fun, but it's information. Anyway, it's been revealed that before Chris Rock was slapped across the face by Will Smith live at the Oscars, Chris had actually asked Jada Pinkett Smith out on a date. Now, when you hear that, you must think, oh, he asked her out before they even met. Nope. The situation actually took place in 2016 at the height of the first round of separation rumors, which it turned out are completely true. At the time, Chris either had some inside info or he believes everything he reads online. According to Jada, Chris reached out and shot his shot, I guess. He called and he said he would love to take her out, which she was like, why? He clarified and told Jada he was under the impression that herself and Will were getting a divorce for real. When she revealed that this wasn't the case, Chris was so embarrassed and began to apologize over and over. Though they eventually moved past the moment, it may explain why Will Smith was so aggressive with Rock at the Oscars. There's no way he was unaware of the situation. Next up, we have the Smiths' self-raised tots. Rumors have been flying around for years that Willow and Jaden Smith basically raised themselves. Their upbringing was nothing to scoff at. Jaden was on track to becoming an actor after starring in the 2008 remake of the classic Karate Kid series alongside martial arts arts and opera legend Jackie Chan, but later shifted his focus to a more entrepreneurial side of things, developing his own fashion brand, which has garnered him massive success. His sister Willow opted to stick with her creative roots, however, has made quite the name for herself in music. Unfortunately, their behavior comes from a place of neglect. During an episode of Red Table Talk, Jaden confronted his parents, calling out their terrible parenting skills. With both being so busy in their careers, they were never home to care for the youngsters. Jaden and Willow recount spending a majority of their childhood with various nannies 
nannies and teachers only seeing their parents between projects or if they were working with their parents, like Jaden and Will in The Pursuit of Happiness. It turns out they were all well aware of the whole separation thing from the very beginning as well. Will and Jada must have been waiting until the kids were financially independent and out of the house to finally call it quits, something they should have done a lot sooner. In that same vein, we have the horrid story of Willow Smith's stalker. In 2021, on her mother's talk show, Red Table Talk, Willow Smith revealed the heartbreaking, terrifying tale of her being cyber stalked. Cyber stalking is a little bit more insidious and scary. This guy was doing that to me, and he was actually doing that to me for a couple of years. He basically got my patterns, Willow Smith had stated. In December 2020, while on a vacation and absent from her house, the stalker broke into her home. Her mother, Jada Pinkett Smith, located a camp that was set up behind the house, created by the stalker. His intention was to wait for Willow to return home. Jada immediately called the police and the authorities recommended throwing out the contents of the fridge and cabinets in case the stalker had placed something harmful in the food. Willow Smith decided to take the stalker to court, filing for a restraining order against him. It was discovered that the man had been stalking her online for years. The restraining order was granted, but Willow Smith still has severe trauma from the whole experience. Next up, we have the birthday brawl, literally. For Jada's 37th birthday, Will decided it would be a great idea to throw a massive surprise party. Now, it wasn't just their celebrity friends, some close family and what have you. He hired party planners to set it up and spent three days planning and getting everything ready, which really isn't that much time. He even booked Mary J. Blige to perform for her. Talk about a birthday gift, but that was not all. He traced her family roots and invited her family members from her long line of lineage. Not only did he find her family, he went out of his way to reach out and invite them to the party. You'd think she'd appreciate this labor of love, uh, but instead she threw it back in his face, claiming he only did it to display his ego, and she hated the fact that he went out of his way to throw a party. He admitted he was devastated when she said those hurtful things, and it even sent him on a downward spiral that negatively impacted his life. This should have been one of the biggest of many red flags. I mean, if somebody just brought my entire family just from nowhere, that would be pretty scary. I, I don't I don't think I'd like that either. I'm kind of with Jada on this one. Finally, we have Tupac. Jada was in a long-term relationship with Tupac years before she met Will, and his untimely passing was the end of their relationship. It's normal and even healthy to miss someone who passed, especially when you were romantically involved with them for years. But in 2012, while she and Will were still married, she posted a picture of her and Tupac in a very intimate embrace, and she captioned the photo, I miss him. It makes sense wanting to share your deep feelings with the world, especially when they're affecting you the most. But that was a questionable photo to choose to post, especially when you're married to someone else. Not to mention Will and Jada's daughter Willow wrote a letter addressed to Tupac after he passed because Willow claimed she knew he was still alive. One of the lines in the letter read, can you please come back so mommy and me can be happy? I think my mommy really misses you. It seems sweet and rather innocent, but at a young age she was aware of how much he still had a hold on Jada and she wanted him to come back into their lives, which at that point seemed like it could have been the end of Will and Jada's marriage. Nothing came of it, obviously, but it makes you question how much Willow actually knew about the situation. Number 10 Underpaying Celebrities This past week on Instagram, Taraji P. Henson delivered a tearful interview that touched on her financial struggles and alluded to the fact that she was being underpaid. And all of this happened while she was promoting the new musical The Color Purple, which was produced by Oprah herself. During this interview, she expressed that she was tired of working hard and getting paid a fraction of what she deserved. In fact, at one point she said she was even contemplating leaving her acting career behind. She told the host that she hears people talk about how hard she works, but the math just isn't mathing. So there is an entire team of people above her that make the majority of the money in the film industry. She voiced her frustrations that every time she does something and breaks through another glass ceiling in Hollywood, when it comes time to negotiate, she is somehow at the bottom again like she never did what she just did. So that wears on her mental health because the question is, why? And what does it mean for her as an actor? Gabrielle Union was there and she backed up her claims saying that there was not a word of a lie told by this woman. Viola Davis also reposted that clip to her Instagram, simply with the caption, this with a few hands pointing up. A little while back, Taraji was seriously considering leaving the US altogether and living in another country. Considering how stellar of an actor she is along with the rest of the cast, Hollywood really needs to get their act together and just pay their people. Number 9. Blackballing Now this story is crazy. The famous comedian Monique has spoken out about confronting Oprah Winfrey over an episode of her talk show that involved her estranged family in 2010. 
incident. She accused Oprah as well as filmmakers Lee Daniels and Tyler Perry of blackballing her in the industry. So in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Monique recounted the strain in her relationship with Oprah because of the time that the talk show host welcomed her estranged family, including her eldest brother, onto the show in 2010. Following her Oscar win that year, Oprah informed Monique that her brother called her and wanted to be on the show to let parents know how they can watch out for creepy people. Apparently she said, do you want to come on the show? Because he wants to apologize to you. In response, she said, Oprah, I don't want any part of that. While she gave her blessing to tape the show with her brother, she was horrified to see other family members like her parents and another one of her brothers downplay what actually happened to her. Number 8. Dissing The View While speaking on The View earlier this week, Oprah appeared to drop some major shade both towards the film, The Color Purple, and the people who were involved with The View. So the producers of The View were very upset that she would not be appearing alongside the cast of the film on one of their episodes. They were hoping to have a kind of reunion involving Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah, because as we know they both starred in the 1985 version of The Color Purple. But that turned out to be a missed opportunity because Oprah did did not appear on the program. The reason that The View was particularly annoyed with her absence is because she has been appearing on other talk shows to promote the film. She went on The Drew Barrymore Show and Sherry Shepard's Sherry. So around the same time she gave a candid interview with People Magazine about her recent weight loss and how she was aided by medication. But back to The View, despite Oprah's absence, the episode was well received and Whoopi said that she felt a strong connection with the people who did end up showing up. Number 7. That Drew Barrymore Moment It seems like Drew just cannot keep her hands to herself and fans have become quite outraged at her behaviour. The actress was blasted as cringy after uncomfortably caressing Oprah Winfrey on an episode of The Drew Barrymore Show. In the clip, the two of them were seen cozied up on the couch while talking about the importance of interacting with the studio audience. Drew tightly held onto Oprah's hand while running her other hand up and down her arm. She said, Something that I learned about you because I didn't know this in detail was that you would spend time with the audience outside of the show you were filming. Oprah then seemed to be trying to get out of her grasp because she adjusted her seating position while answering that question. She said, It is necessary. My crew used to be like, Oh my god, how much time are you going to spend talking to the audience? Drew then let go of her guest while she was preparing to ask something else. For her part, Oprah then started talking with her hands while applauding Drew for running the daytime talk show without an audience during the pandemic. Number 6. The NDAs Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood, as we know. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made Tom Cruise's muffin. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign the document. Apparently, one former employee by the name of Elizabeth Cody tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was stopped by the courts. Because she was still tied to the agreement that she signed. These NDAs were not meant to be a way just to keep the show secret safe, but any and all secrets that Oprah kept as well. According to Elizabeth, the documents were signed by almost everyone in her life. Now she might have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that is not exactly how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company, Unica's Performance Training, claiming that they were being fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving the advertising with her name or the website of the show. Number 5. Strange Beliefs Oprah has had plenty of controversial people on her show, from the so-called medical experts to psychologists and even celebrities. But one particular incident that caused a lot of backlash for her was when she did an interview with Suzanne Summers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets about how she was able to look so young. According to Summers, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help, and she claims that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone in her other arm. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stood the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and a self-help author, but surprisingly she was not. A medical expert started bashing Oprah claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses, potentially even cancer. 
Despite Suzanne's claim that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and are safe, they're actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you could buy from a pharmacy. So Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that the methods were useful, even claiming to have used these methods to make her feel incredible. So this person would rather risk her audience potentially getting cancer than just tell them the truth. Number four, the car situation. So everyone knows Oprah's famous words, you get a car and you get a car and everyone gets a car. This was a historical moment of her series and it was parodied time and time again. In fact, it is still memed to this day. However, what many people don't know is that when someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. Of course there is. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay over $7,000 in taxes first. While Oprah's studio would cover the sales tax and the registration for each car, their audience members were given a choice to either pay the seven grand or simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box that was all caught on camera that Oprah claimed to be there for the new car. But of course, everything has a catch. For someone who was known as being charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something completely different to Oprah. Number three, fake memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996 and had a reading encouragement segment on her talk show where she talked about any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, Oprah picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Brett about his years-long struggle with substance issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best-selling non-fiction book of the year and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut-wrenching. But the following year, a news outlet ran an explosive article about Frey after it was discovered that he had either made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. But it turned out that he was never on that train, nor did he have any involvement in that situation. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked James why he felt the need to lie to herself and her readers, and he tried everything, making every excuse in the world. He claimed that he altered a lot of details, but that the overall plot was still real. The studio audience then responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps, and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience as it was not her intention, but by that point the damage was already done. Number to Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka unwelcome to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appears on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turned out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub, and Whoopi confronted her, leading to an adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad, to which Oprah replied, why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me. And after this, they mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute. And coming in at number one, Cindy Crawford. The model and actress called out Oprah over her 1986 interview that took place on her talk show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Cindy reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV+. This documentary spotlights the careers of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course, Cindy Crawford. So in a clip from the documentary, Oprah is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked, did she always have this body? This is unbelievable, stand up. Now that is what I call a body. At this point, Cindy is visibly uncomfortable and then she stands up before the studio audience cheered and showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment being told what to do. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type of situation. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do. But eventually it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. 
The most shocking thing for her was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman who was supposedly known for her kindness and generosity also made her feel like a puppet. Number 10, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of The Woman in Me, a memoir by Britney Spears, is of course a revelation on what really happened while she was dating her Mickey Mouse Club co-star, Justin Timberlake. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection and their connection was strong, but unfortunately Britney had to make a terrible decision in the year 2000 when she found out she was pregnant. And at first she was very excited about the whole thing because she wanted to be a parent. In her book, she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin, but I guess it was just gonna be a little bit earlier than she expected. Well, it turns out Justin, not so excited and told her that they were both too young to start a family, continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. This revelation may be part of the reason that Justin reportedly was so nervous leading up to the book's release, and since the book's release, he's had to turn off his Instagram notifications because, hey, he's terrible and people want to let him know. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her, she would have gone through with the pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims that she only did this because Justin clearly didn't want to be the dad, and in the book she said that looking back, it was one of the most agonizing things she had ever experienced in her life. Number nine, Jamie Foxx. So this is one of the more recent secrets that's been revealed, so to speak. Uh, so far, this is just an allegation, but a woman is suing Jamie Foxx for alleged physical mistreatment at a rooftop restaurant. The allegations are being backed up by a two eyewitnesses, a friend of the victim, and a security guard who saw the whole thing go down and let it happen. According to the unnamed woman, she spotted Jamie at a restaurant around 11 p.m. and after a couple of hours decided to ask him for a picture. Jamie was apparently under the influence and according to the accuser, he became very handsy as the night progressed. He said yes to the picture and then apparently said that the woman had a model's body and smelled good. Then there are some darker and honestly pretty disturbing details that I can't go into in this channel, but if they're true, something tells me Jamie's career may be done. Truly just dark stuff. The court case is being brought forward as the Survivors Act is about to be implemented in the US. This act allows victims of physical offenses to bring civil cases to court after the statute of limitations has expired. The statute means that after a certain amount of time has passed, the victim can no longer file criminal charges. However, the new act means that civil cases are good to go. So we will see what happens to Jamie in the coming weeks. Number eight, Lizzo. Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of the lawsuit being brought up against her, it looks like all that positivity may have just been an act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I'm not a small man. In fact, I have what many call a dad bod, and I'm very cool with it. So I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves, but come on, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shames her team and makes them feel that they are too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these claims. One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who is part of this lawsuit, was fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently and her apparently disliking the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that she wasn't committing to the role. She was also bringing her dancers to weird places and making them do weird things. Lizzo was at a club at Amsterdam's Red Light District when she coerced, aka, forced a dancer to touch a woman's bare chest despite saying no several times. She also made them eat bananas from some no-no zones. Again, nobody's idea of fun. Currently, there is still a court case up in the air and no one knows what will happen, but so far Lizzo is maintaining that she did nothing and will prove her innocence. Number seven, Russell Brand. Even before the controversy surrounding Russell Brand came up this year, this dude was unwelcome everywhere. Royal events, awards shows, kids' birthday parties, who knows? For anyone who doesn't know, I'm really Really sorry to be the one to tell you, but Russell Brand is a terrible person. The man known best as a comedian, a bringer of joy, was secretly manipulative, aggressive, and at times violent with his ex-partners. Following in the news that a documentary about his life and career was set to release on BBC's Channel 4, several complaints got filed against him, alleging mistreatment during their time together. The allegations were actually reinforced by Russell's ex, Katy Perry, who they dated for quite some time, and she came to learn that Russell was short-tempered, opinionated, and stubborn. Russell's career was canceled, 
old and he's currently awaiting a trial. Number six, Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors is currently the man behind Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. He was written as an important person in that franchise, being a villain in a couple of movies and recently a villain in the Loki TV show. Unfortunately for Jonathan Majors, an ex has come forward and alleged that Jonathan was physically violent towards her while they were together. Since March of this year, Majors and his team had been adamant that the situation was blown out of proportions and that there really is nothing to be upset about, which is always a fun thing to say to people during these situations. In fact, in June, Majors filed his own cross complaint accusing his accuser. The prosecutors refuted these claims and told him they had no plans on prosecuting Grace Jafari, who was the woman who accused him. Majors has been dropped from his agency and so far his role on TV and film is pretty up in the air. I mean, his character Kang may even be kicked out of the MCU and replaced by Doctor Doom. So let's see what happens as the year progresses. Number five, Jada Pinkett Smith. Cheating rumors and dating scandals followed Jada and Will throughout their entire relationship. Since day one, people were convinced that they were in an open relationship or had just been straight up cheating on each other. Turns out that those rumors were kind of true because ahead of the release of her book, Worthy, Jada sat down with People Magazine and every other news outlet to share some inside info. The most revealing one was that herself and Will Smith were actually separated for seven years. Of course, that's not all though. Jada is slowly ruining that guy's life and then some. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016, they just became exhausted with each other. The news of their separation was a mild shock at best because Super Sleuth fans claimed that they had proof Will and Jada were separated a long time ago. Some of the clips that were submitted as evidence of Will and Jada disprove it because Will and Jada was on Red Table Talk and he looks drained. He just looks like a man dealing with so much mentally speaking. In her conversation with Will, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just outright admitting the information, she decided to hold on to it until the release of her book. A lot of Jada fans commented on the resurfaced clips, and we can all agree just Will is having a rough time, and I, I just feel for this guy at this point. I could go on and on about how terrible Jada Pinkett Smith is, but I've only got a couple of minutes, and I already wrote a lot of lists about why she's bad, so go check him out. Number four, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991. Despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids cartoon, the crew had a small following and garnered quite a bit of success. Enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted, picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark play the leading man, Danny Wallace, a police officer who attempts to stop substance trafficking and corruption by the Chinese triads. He had a successful acting career that's recently been declining in quality, but he's still acting and he looks great at 52, so please don't hurt me, Mark Wahlberg. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young and he became addicted to No No Snow by the time he was 13. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested at the age of 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was walking home late one night under the influence of hallucinogens when he spotted the men. Close friends at the time confirmed that Mark did have a bit of a racial bias with his upbringing, which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who, you know, wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them, which made contact and knocked one of them unconscious. He was eventually released after serving only 45 days of a two-year prison sentence, and he vowed to change his life forever. So far, that promise seems to be kept, and I can personally confirm that he's a very polite and patient person because he watched a movie at a theater I used to work at. He travels with like five people at all times. It's a little intimidating. Number three, Margot Robbie. Margot may be a perfect Barbie on screen, but apparently behind the scenes, she may be a psycho. In a recent interview with BBC Radio 1, Margot reminisced about a little prank she pulled on an old babysitter. It involved kitchen cutters, which is the word I'm forced to use for n See, they bleep it out. Apparently, Margot has just gotten a new babysitter, a much older woman that just was not as cool as Talia, her old babysitter. So she hatched a plan of sweet, sweet revenge. After a particularly trying day where Margot refused to take a bath, she decided to kick the old lady out for good and grabbed ketchup, a stabby jabby device, and laid face down on the kitchen tiles. You know, the old I'm kind of dead routine. As you may expect, her babysitter walked in, took one look, screamed, and just jogged out the door. She was gone. She traumatized the woman who quit, and Margot successfully got her old babysitter back. But that's very messed up, and Margot was so young when she did that. That is so dark. A dark place for someone's mind to go that early on. Was she secretly a little crazy this whole time? Might explain why she is the best Harley Quinn we've ever seen on screen. Number two, Tim Allen. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear, the star of ABC's popular sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. And while he may have played a family man on TV, a lot of fans may not know that Tim 
was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some pretty bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a couple of bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport and was caught with more than 650 grams, 1.4 pounds, of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 grams or more. Like there was a guy from the government just next to his car like, oh, 650, all right, well, if you got 650, then you're going to jail. However, that sentence was never served and it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities, it led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state one, so he was able to ignore that new policy. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. So think about this entire entry and tell me that wouldn't be a great movie. Number one, Danny Matheson. Danny Matheson was that 70s show's popular boy and it helped launch several careers, including Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, and of course himself. Danny was also on this show and it turns out the allegations against him date back to 2004 and were reported in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation took place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production of that 70s show and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table because it was just that time, so Danny was let go and the whole thing was forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila watched this dude shut down their project and still said, hey, he's a great guy. When the charges come up again 15 years later, people are still sticking to his side that he was friends with, but it turns out that he was an actual menace and a horror horrible person and he's gonna go to jail. Thankfully in 2023, it's a lot easier to confirm allegations like this and he was recently sentenced to three years in prison. In an ironic twist that only the digital age could serve up, it seems even the great Oprah isn't immune to a social media slip up. Picture this, you're scrolling through your feed when you see Oprah praising the Microsoft Surface, claiming it's her go-to gift for the holiday. Quite the endorsement, right? Well, not so fast. Eagle-eyed followers quickly spotted something amiss. The tweet was sent from an iPad. The rival tech of the surface. Talk about being caught in the act. Not the best look when you're trying to give a shout out to a product that supposedly won your heart. Or at least that's what sponsors would like everyone to believe. It's a modern day tale of endorsements gone wrong and a reminder that on the internet, Someone's always watching. This mishap with Oprah leads us into a broader conversation about the authenticity of celebrity endorsements. In the age of social media, it peels back the curtain on the fact that sometimes endorsements are less about personal preference and more about contractual agreements. It's a stark reminder to consumers that while celebrity backing might bring a product to our attention, it doesn't always mean it's their genuine gadget of choice. Oprah has been called out for using weight loss medication despite being a longtime ambassador for Weight Watchers. The famous talk show host confirmed she was using this medication to help her weight. In a revealing chat, she said her slim figure is thanks to the medication and a healthier lifestyle overall. She's admitted to using the weight loss med, Ozempic, and no one is saying that she should be hated for doing what she wants to her body, but she should think about the unrealistic standards she has set when she was initially lying about taking meds for weight loss while promoting Weight Watchers. Oprah has stepped into the spotlight not to host a show, but to address the recent criticisms around the People's Fund of Maui, a cause she passionately advocates for. Along with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Oprah launched this heartfelt initiative seeding a staggering $10 million to assist those affected by Maui's devastating wildfires. The goal was straightforward, provide direct financial support to the victims. However, not everyone saw it that way. The internet erupted with heated debates, some accusing the duo of not doing enough despite their concerns considerable donation. Oprah's reply? She genuinely believed that their contribution was substantial, the kind that would typically receive a standing ovation at fundraising galas. But the morning after their big pledge, instead of applause, there was a digital uproar. I woke up, checked the news, and was met with a barrage of negativity, Oprah recounted on CBS Mornings. Describing the intense scrutiny she faced, Dwayne Johnson, deeply connected to the islands by heritage and childhood memories, has yet to weigh in on the controversy. And 
let's talk about the time Ludacris made an appearance on Oprah's show. Now, the dude was there to shine a light on his role in the movie Crash. You know, that intense drama from 2004 that snagged a bunch of awards, but things didn't go as planned. Luda opens up about how, instead of focusing on the movie, he found himself in the hot seat, facing some tough questions about his hip hop lyrics. He wasn't shy about saying the final cut of the interview seemed to lean heavily in Oprah's favor, with some of his key points on the cutting room floor. She kept her own comments while a lot of mine got axed, he shared in a GQ interview. It turns out Luda wasn't even slated to be on the show initially. They called him up last minute, and after all that, Oprah had a private chat with him expressing her views on what it means to feature rappers on her show. Ludacris compares the whole experience to an awkward visit where you feel like the host isn't thrilled to have you over. In a scorching critique, actress Rose McGowan has leveled some heavy accusations against one of television's most beloved figures. In an explosive tweet, McGowan lashed out, calling Oprah as fake as they come. She expresses a sense of vindication that the public is starting to see a side of Oprah she perceives as disingenuous. McOwen, a pivotal voice in the hashtag MeToo movement, doesn't mince words, openly wishing the renowned talk show host's authenticity to match her public persona. The Twitter war between Rose and Oprah has made headlines with many wondering where the root of their animosity lies. It seems that McOwen's main issue with Winfrey stems from her perceived hypocrisy in light of recent events involving an extremely controversial person. She's been vocal about holding powerful figures accountable for their actions, and in this case, she believes Winfrey is not practicing what she preaches. This raises an important question about how much we truly know about the people we idolize and put on a pedestal in our society. In her stirring speech at the Golden Globe Awards, Oprah once again demonstrated why she is considered such a powerful and motivational figure. Her successful entrepreneurial journey, her impactful philanthropy, and her natural heartfelt connect with people are truly commendable. However, there's a twist in the tale. Over time, Oprah has, through different media avenues, unintentionally promoted some questionable health practices. This very aspect had the scientific community in a bit of an uproar. On YouTube, we often talk about the influence celebrities have on public opinion, and Oprah's case is particularly fascinating. Notably boosted Dr. Oz's popularity, who, despite being a charming TV personality, has faced criticism for advocating medical advice and products lacking scientific backing. Consider the episode with the green coffee bean extract, a supposed weight loss miracle that fell flat after closer scrutiny and legal intervention. It's concerning when only a fraction of health recommendations on a show like The Dr. Oz Show stand up to scientific validation. And yet, even after distancing herself slightly by canceling Oz's radio show amidst professional pushback, Oprah maintains ties with him, showcasing the complex relationship between media influence, celebrity endorsement, and evidence-based medicine. In another contentious twist in media careers, Oprah played a pivotal role in the rise of Philip, Dr. Phil McGraw, who now reigns as daytime TV's top earner. Portrayed as the valiant hero who saves people from the grips of addiction, Dr. Phil's approach is not without its detractors. A joint investigation by Stat and the Boston Globe cast a critical eye on the Dr. Phil show, revealing troubling allegations that in chasing ratings, the welfare of certain guests was jeopardized, facing withdrawal without proper medical aid, and episodes indicating coercive nudges towards dangerous situations just to procure meds. As intense as these revelations are, the show's spokesperson denies them all. Further probing unearthed evidence, suggesting that the carrot for treatment centers to buy into Dr. Phil's virtual reality venture, a series of VR scenarios where he offers advice, is none other than the promise of publicity across his and related platforms. While Oprah Winfrey's intentions in championing alternative medicine are likely well-intentioned, her influence has unfortunately had a negative impact on scientific understanding amongst the American populace. This phenomenon, often referred to as the Oprahfication of medicine, is a concern that surgical oncologist Dr. David Gorski, a contributor to the science-based medicine website, has expressed disappointment over. As pointed out by A.V. Salk of the Washington Post, should Winfrey ever decide to enter the political arena, her advocacy for unconventional medical practices could present numerous challenges that would need addressing during her campaign. With an estimated 44 million viewers per week, Oprah has a powerful platform to spread her beliefs and opinions, and while she may have good intentions with her advocacy for alternative medicine, her influence has unfortunately led to a dangerous trend of misinformation and pseudoscience. Dr. Gorski points out, Winfrey's promotion of unproven or debunked treatments can have harmful consequences for those who trust her and follow her advice. In the Apple TV Plus docuseries, The Supermodels, Cindy Crawford has dropped some bombshell comments about a moment with Oprah that's got the internet seriously buzzing. So buckle up, because we're going back to 1986 when a 20-year-old Cindy graced the Oprah Winfrey show. But here's the twist. Cindy 
alongside her agent, John Casablancas, didn't just sit for a chat. She had to stand and showcase her model physique. Fast forward to the docuseries and Cindy is calling out this moment as not cool, especially by today's standards. It's a real look-see moment as Cindy felt objectified, a stark contrast to Oprah's celebrated history of empowering women, but hey, opinions differ. And entertainment reporter Stephanie Tacky offers a different angle, reminding us that supermodel status is often tied to their iconic figures. Was it just the nature of the 80s showbiz? Was it more about respecting Cindy's legendary career? Cindy's comments have sparked a debate about the treatment of models. In recent years, there has been a significant shift towards body positivity and embracing all body types in the fashion world. In an Elle magazine interview back in January 2006, which later circulated on TMZ, 50 Cent offered a critique of Oprah, suggesting that her originally targeted audience and point of view had shifted. He claimed Winfrey, once a voice resonating with black women, had progressively directed her content towards middle-aged white women to the point where he felt she represented that demographic. 50 Cent's remarks were accompanied by a symbolic gesture of naming his dog Oprah as a subtle jab. However, the rapper and talk show icon addressed their differences in an episode of Oprah's next chapter, where 50 Cent highlighted that he felt targeted by her critiques, which directly opposed the themes in his music. Number 10. Russell Brand. Even before the controversy surrounding Russell Brand came up this year, this dude was unwelcome at royal events, award shows, birthday parties, anything and everything public. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm sorry to be the one to inform you, Russell Brand is secretly a terrible person. The man known best as a comedian, a bringer of joy, has secretly been manipulative, aggressive, and at times violent with his ex-partners. Following the news that a documentary about his life and career was set to release on BBC Channel 4, several complaints were filed by exes alleging that Russell had mistreated them during their time together. The allegations were actually reinforced by Russell's ex fiance Katy Perry. They dated for over a year and a half, and in that time, she came to learn that Russell was short-tempered, opinionated, and stubborn, qualities that make a man a terrible person. Russell's career was canceled, and he's currently awaiting a trial. Number 9. The Oprah Maui Scandal Oprah has been claiming to be many things since the Maui backlash has begun. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she's made her mark in the public as a woman who cares so much. So much that she's asking you to give her your money as well. Isn't that nice? Well, not really. The money that she donated turned out to be taxed, so she didn't actually donate anything. And of course, the main issue that people have with Oprah is that she's a billionaire asking average everyday people for money. As I've mentioned in previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah has had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her. When the fire started raging, she started fundraising. Think about all of the things that have happened in the past few years. We all forgot about Australia being on fire in 2020, Western Canada was on fire earlier this year, some parts of Florida have been underwater and are still right now. Yet, Oprah has decided to dedicate her time and money to helping out the area where she has a vacation home. Number 8. Colleen Ballinger Former YouTuber Colleen was accused by several of her young fans as being a creepy creepo who wanted to be their friend. Colleen is best known for her character Miranda Sings on YouTube, who became so popular that she received her own Netflix series. If you want to watch it, I'm sure you'll need a VPN or something. It's probably banned in every country. She was basically messaging her fans to deliver so-called advice when she was really trying to just manipulate them into being her little minions. And not the little yellow guys with the glasses, that'd be different. There was a massive amount of proof in the pudding. Fans had screenshots of conversations with one fan claiming that she actually sent him lingerie as a joke. <laughs> oh man, lace underwear, hilarious. Following instant backlash from the world, Colleen decided to post an apology online, which she did, while playing a ukulele. This woman is shown to be weird to everyone and she thought it was appropriate to go online and sing about it. In response to the cringiest apology of all time, her fans resurfaced a video that really should have gotten her canceled when it first came out. A few years ago, she decided that it would be an awesome idea during one of her live shows to sing and dance to Beyonce's single ladies while in blackface. Yeah, it's just, it is the roughest clip of Colleen. She's just barefoot on stage, wildly flailing and waving her arms, and nobody at that show was like, eh, that's weird. 
Yeah, the world's great. Number seven, Jada Pinkett Smith. Cheating rumors and dating scandals have followed Jada and Will Smith throughout their entire relationship. Since day one, people have been convinced that they're in an open relationship or they were cheating on each other on and off. Well, it turns out that some of those rumors were actually true. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jada sat down with People Magazine to share some inside information. The most revealing was that herself and Will Smith have actually been separated for like seven years. Now, of course, that's not all. Jada's actually slowly ruining this man's life and mental health. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016, they had become exhausted with trying to make things work. The news of their separation was like a mild shock at best because super sleuth fans claim to have proof Will and Jada have been separated forever, and the proof is in the interviews. The first clip to be submitted as evidence was Will and Jada's Red Table Talk interaction, where she admitted to the entanglement with August Alzina, simultaneously admitting to a brief separation. In the conversation, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just telling us right then and there, she decided to hold on to that information for a better time. A lot of Jada fans have commented on the resurfaced clip saying that Will looks drained like he's clearly dealing with a ton mentally speaking. Now I could go on and on about how terrible Jada is, but I've done lots of videos about that in the past, so go and check those out. Number six, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of The Woman in Me, a memoir by Britney Spears, is of course the revelation of what really happened while Britney and her Mickey Mouse Club co-star Justin Timberlake were together. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection. Their connection was strong, but unfortunately Britney had to make a different difficult decision in the year 2000, after she found out she was pregnant. At first, Britney was actually pretty excited about the whole thing, you know, in her book she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin at some point, just that this was going to be a little bit earlier than she expected. Well, turns out Justin was not so excited and told her that they were both too young to be starting a family, continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. The revelation may be part of the reason that Justin has reportedly been so nervous leading up to the book's release, and might be why he's turned his Instagram comments off. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her, that she would have gone through with the pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims to have only done it because Justin so clearly didn't want to be the dad. In the book, she said that looking back, it is one of the most agonizing things she has ever experienced in her life. Number five, Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors is currently the man behind the purple cape of Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. Kang has been written as a very important figure in Marvel. In Ant-Man Quantumania, he was the main antagonist, only he was just acting as a variant of the real antagonist, which was an army of Kangs from across the multiverse. I know, I'm gonna get geeky for a second. Including He Who Remains, a Kang variant from Loki, who once again acted as a major part of the Loki series. Unfortunately for Majors, an ex has come forward and alleged that Jonathan was physically violent towards her while they were together. Since March of this year, Majors and his team have been adamant that the situation is blown out of proportions and that there's nothing to be upset about. In fact, in June, Majors filed his own cross-complaint accusing the accuser. Prosecutors refuted these claims and told him that they had no plans to prosecute Grace Jabari, the woman who accused him. Majors has been dropped from his agency, and so far his role on TV and film is up in the air. A spoiler alert for Loki Season 2, the series ended with Kang not really being he who remains anymore, and it's unclear of what's going to actually happen. Now, there have been rumors that his role in the MCU as the big bad will be replaced by Doctor Doom, so we'll see. Sorry if you don't like nerdy stuff. That's just my little tangent. Number four, Lizzo. Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of a lawsuit being brought against her, it seems like all the positivity might have just been an act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I am not a small man. In fact, I have what many people consider to be a dad bod, and hey, I'm cool with that, so I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves. But like, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera, and when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shamed her team and made them feel like they were too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these claims. One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who is part of the lawsuit, was actually fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently, and Lizzo apparently disliking the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that Crystal just wasn't committing to her role. She was also bringing her dancers to strange places and making them do 
things against their will. Lizzo was at a club in Amsterdam's red light district when she coerced, aka forced, one of her dancers to touch a woman's bare chest, not something that she wanted to do. She also made them eat bananas from some no-no zones that, again, not their idea of fun. Currently, it's still up in the air as to what the outcome will be in this trial, and so far Lizzo is maintaining that she has done nothing wrong and will prove her innocence any day. Number three, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner. Joe and Sophie got together back in 2016 after they had been set up by mutual friends, something that they had apparently been trying to do for quite some time. They got together and instantly fell in love, getting married just over a year after getting together. Sophie admitted to Rolling Stones in 2019 that she was hesitant at first because Joe was a big musician, she was a big TV and film star, meaning that most of the time they would be on opposite ends of the world. Eventually, she warmed up and got together with Joe officially. The split came out of nowhere. For the most part, their relationship has seemed to be stable on the outside. They were never a part of cheating scandals, which is surprising considering Joe's lack of discretion. There were never any strange rumors, photos. They were just like a happy couple. As of September 1st, Joe Jonas filed for a divorce from Sophie, with the only current information being that Joe has claimed the relationship is irre irretrievably broken. Something pretty serious must have gone down in a very short amount of time because only hours before this announcement, Joe posted a photo of himself on Instagram with his ring on full display. Now, despite the minimal amount of tea spilt so far, we are in for one super messy and public divorce. Things have settled down a bit in the past few weeks, but Sophie was actually just spotted getting cozy with another dude very recently, so you can imagine who's taking things harder at this point. Number two, Danny Matheson. That 70s show was a popular sitcom that helped launch several careers, including Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. Danny was, of course, also on that show, but it turns out the allegations that date back to 2004 surrounding Danny were uh, reported in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation took place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table, so Danny was let go and the entire thing was forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila literally watched this man go in for questioning and still called him a role model in their character witness letters. It just makes no sense. Their jobs were literally stopped while this man was under investigation, and when the charge came up again 15 years later, they were still on his side. Thankfully, in 2023, it's a lot easier to confirm allegations of this nature, and he was recently sentenced to three years in prison. So, justice served. Number one, Jonah Hill. Jonah was once the funniest man in town, shifting his efforts to the world of drama and creating a really nice career where he could just do anything he wanted, really. Unfortunately for fans of Jonah Hill, some information came out earlier this year that called his character into question. Uh, reminder, this isn't my opinion. These are things that just happened to the world in our public knowledge, okay? An ex-girlfriend of Jonah's posted screenshots from past conversations, and the conversations ranged from Jonah just asking her to tone down the photo she was posting to asking her not to do her job. For those of you who don't know, his ex Sarah works as a surfing instructor, and Jonah was asking her to not surf with men while working and that she wear more than a bikini while she did so. When Sarah released these screenshots, she underlined them calling Jonah a narcissistic misogynist, but also said she didn't really want anything bad to happen to him, so eh. Since the messages have been released, there has been a massive online debate as to where Jonah stands in the eyes of the public. Some people feel that canceling him entirely is just a bit too much, and compared to some of the other scandals in Hollywood, especially that I just covered, Jonah Hill is relatively chill. Others want his name wiped from the face of the planet and never to be heard from again, so I don't know, give and take. In an ironic twist that only the digital age could serve up, it seems even the great Oprah isn't immune to a social media slip up. Picture this, you're scrolling through your feed when you see Oprah praising the Microsoft Surface, claiming it's her go-to gift for the holiday. Quite the endorsement, right? Well, not so fast. Eagle-eyed followers quickly spotted something amiss. The tweet was sent from an iPad. The rival tech of the Surface. Talk about being caught in the act. Not the best look when you're trying to give a shout out to a product that supposedly won your heart. Or at least that's what sponsors would like everyone to believe. It's a modern day tale of endorsements gone wrong and a reminder that on the internet, Someone's always watching. This mishap with Oprah leads us into a broader conversation about the authenticity of celebrity endorsements. In the age of social media, it peels back the curtain on the fact that sometimes endorsements are less about personal preference 
and more about contractual agreements. It's a stark reminder to consumers that while celebrity backing might bring a product to our attention, it doesn't always mean it's their genuine gadget of choice. Oprah has been called out for using weight loss medication despite being a longtime ambassador for Weight Watchers. The famous talk show host confirmed she was using this medication to help her weight. In a revealing chat, she said her slim figure is thanks to the medication and a healthier lifestyle overall. She's admitted to using the weight loss med Ozempic, and no one is saying that she should be hated for doing what she wants to her body, but she should think about the unrealistic standards she has set when she was initially lying about taking meds for weight loss while promoting Weight Watchers. Oprah has stepped into the spotlight not to host a show, but to address the recent criticisms around the People's Fund of Maui, a cause she passionately advocates for. Along with Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Oprah launched this heartfelt initiative seeding a staggering $10 million to assist those affected by Maui's devastating wildfires. The goal was straightforward, provide direct financial support to the victims. However, not everyone saw it that way. The internet erupted with heated debates, some accusing the duo of not doing enough despite their concerns considerable donation. Oprah's reply? She genuinely believed that their contribution was substantial, the kind that would typically receive a standing ovation at fundraising galas. But the morning after their big pledge, instead of applause, there was a digital uproar. I woke up, checked the news, and was met with a barrage of negativity, Oprah recounted on CBS Mornings. Describing the intense scrutiny she faced, Dwayne Johnson, deeply connected to the islands by heritage and childhood memories, has yet to weigh in on the controversy. And let's talk about the time Ludacris made an appearance on Oprah's show. Now the dude was there to shine a light on his role in the movie Crash. You know, that intense drama from 2004 that snagged a bunch of awards, but things didn't go as planned. Luda opens up about how instead of focusing on the movie, he found himself in the hot seat facing some tough questions about his hip hop lyrics. He wasn't shy about saying the final cut of the interview seemed to lean heavily in Oprah's favor with some of his key points on the cutting room floor. She kept her own comments while a lot of mine got axed he shared in a GQ interview. It turns out Luda wasn't even slated to be on the show initially. They called him up last minute. And after all that, Oprah had a private chat with him expressing her views on what it means to feature rappers on her show. Ludacris compares the whole experience to an awkward visit where you feel like the host isn't thrilled to have you over. In a scorching critique, actress Rose McGowan has leveled some heavy accusations against one of television's most beloved figures. In an explosive tweet, McGowan lashed out calling Oprah as fake as they come. She expresses a sense of vindication that the public is starting to see a side of Oprah she perceives as disingenuous. McOwen, a pivotal voice in the hashtag MeToo movement, doesn't mince words, openly wishing the renowned talk show host's authenticity to match her public persona. The Twitter war between Rose and Oprah has made headlines with many wondering where the root of their animosity lies. It seems that McOwen's main issue with Winfrey stems from her perceived hypocrisy in light of recent events involving an extremely controversial person. She's been vocal about holding powerful figures accountable for their actions, and in this case, she believes Winfrey is not practicing what she preaches. This raises an important question about how much we truly know about the people we idolize and put on a pedestal in our society. In her stirring speech at the Golden Globe Awards, Oprah once again demonstrated why she is considered such a powerful and motivational figure. Her successful entrepreneurial journey, her impactful philanthropy, and her natural heartfelt connect with people are truly commendable. However, there's a twist in the tale. Over time, Oprah has, through different media avenues, unintentionally promoted some questionable health practices. This very aspect had the scientific community in a bit of an uproar. On YouTube, we often talk about the influence celebrities have on public opinion, and Oprah's case is particularly fascinating. Notably boosted Dr. Oz's popularity, who, despite being a charming TV personality, has faced criticism for advocating medical advice and products lacking scientific backing. Consider the episode with the green coffee bean extract, a supposed weight loss miracle that fell flat after closer scrutiny and legal intervention. It's concerning when only a fraction of health recommendations on a show like The Dr. Oz Show stand up to scientific validation. And yet, even after distancing herself slightly by canceling Oz's radio show amidst professional pushback, Oprah maintains ties with him showcasing the complex relationship between media influence, celebrity endorsement, and evidence-based medicine. In another contentious twist in media careers, Oprah played a pivotal role in the rise of Philip, Dr. Phil McGraw, who now raises daytime TV's top earner. Portrayed as the valiant hero who saves people 
people from the grips of addiction. Dr. Phil's approach is not without its detractors. A joint investigation by STAT and the Boston Globe cast a critical eye on the Dr. Phil show, revealing troubling allegations that in chasing ratings, the welfare of certain guests was jeopardized, facing withdrawal without proper medical aid, and episodes indicating coercive nudges towards dangerous situations just to procure meds. As intense as these revelations are, the show's spokesperson denies them all. Further probing unearthed evidence suggesting that the carrot for treatment centers to buy into Dr. Phil's virtual reality venture, a series of VR scenarios where he offers advice, is none other than the promise of publicity across his and related platforms. While Oprah Winfrey's intentions in championing alternative medicine are likely well intentioned, her influence has unfortunately had a negative impact on scientific understanding amongst the American populace. This phenomenon, often referred to as the Oprahfication of medicine, is a concern that surgical oncologist Dr. David Gorski, a contributor to the science based medicine website, has expressed disappointment over. As pointed out by A.V. Salk of the Washington Post, should Winfrey ever decide to enter the political arena, her advocacy for unconventional medical practices could present numerous challenges that would need addressing during her campaign. With an estimated 44 million viewers per week, Oprah has a powerful platform to spread her beliefs and opinions, and while she may have good intentions with her advocacy for alternative medicine, her influence has unfortunately led to a dangerous trend of misinformation and pseudoscience. Dr. Gorski points out, Winfrey's promotion of unproven or debunked treatments can have harmful consequences for those who trust her and follow her advice. In the Apple TV Plus docuseries, The Supermodels, Cindy Crawford has dropped some bombshell comments about a moment with Oprah that's got the internet seriously buzzing. So buckle up, because we're going back to 1986 when a 20 year old Cindy graced the Oprah Winfrey show. But here's the twist. Cindy alongside her agent, John Casablanca, didn't just sit for a chat. She had to stand and showcase her model physique. Fast forward to the docuseries and Cindy is calling out this moment as not cool, especially by today's standards. It's a real look-see moment as Cindy felt objectified, a stark contrast to Oprah's celebrated history of empowering women, but Hey, opinions differ, and entertainment reporter Stephanie Tacky offers a different angle, reminding us that supermodel status is often tied to their iconic figures. Was it just the nature of the 80s showbiz? Was it more about respecting Cindy's legendary career? Cindy's comments have sparked a debate about the treatment of models. In recent years, there has been a significant shift towards body positivity and embracing all body types in the fashion world. In an Elle magazine interview back in January 2006, which later circulated on TMZ, 50 Cent offered a critique of Oprah, suggesting that her originally targeted audience and point of view had shifted. He claimed Winfrey, once a voice resonating with black women, had progressively directed her content towards middle-aged white women to the point where he felt she represented that demographic. 50 Cent's remarks were accompanied by a symbolic gesture of naming his dog Oprah as a subtle jab. However, the rapper and talk show icon addressed her differences in an episode of Oprah's next chapter, where 50 Cent highlighted that he felt targeted by her critiques, which directly opposed the themes in his music. Number 10, Fabricated memoir. Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment for her talk show that turned any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, Winfrey picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years long struggle with substance control issues. Now, A Million Little Pieces became the best selling nonfiction book of the year, and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called Gut Wrenching. However, the following year, a news outlet ran a a very expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he had made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells the story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. Yeah, he was never on that train, nor did he have any involvement in that situation. That was just something he thought it was neat to put in his book. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed a few feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked why James felt the need to lie to herself and to her readers, and he tried everything, making every excuse that he could think of. He claimed that he altered a lot of the details, but that the overall plot was real. Yeah, that claim caused the studio audience to respond with a massive wave of boos 
coos, gasps, and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience, as it was not really her intention, but the damage was already done. His career as a writer is non existent. Number nine, Harry and Meghan. Harry and Meghan have appeared in the public eye more and more in the past few years. After leaving the duties of their royal family to live on their own, they decided to capitalize on their so called fame by releasing a series of different medias, books, podcasts, documentaries, and in 2021, they sat down with Oprah Winfrey to air every single piece of dirty laundry that they had left in their hamper. Of course, the royal family does not appreciate their secrets being shared with the entire world, so not only was everyone blacklisted by them, but the interview kind of soiled their reputations as good people. According to fans of the Oprah Winfrey show, the interview made the couple look more villainous than it was intended. Following the interview, their public image was slightly tainted, and with more media coming out, it was just, it made the situation so much worse. Megan got a podcast and couldn't come up with material for the first year. They made a documentary that people didn't like, so who knows what they'll get up to next. It certainly won't be anything good. Number eight, Lance Armstrong. Seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong has gone down in history as a man who is unable to ride a bike without chemical training wheels. In an interview with Oprah Winfrey in 2013, Lance was brought on to discuss the allegations floating around regarding his status as a Tour de France winner. Several sources claimed that Lance had to take performance enhancing substances to win all of his races, as well as a type of transfusion involving the red life juice that lives inside all of us. Armstrong went on air and fessed up to every single thing that they were claiming he had done. However, he did deny the notion that he was some kind of a mastermind who was controlling his teammates and forcing them to join in his extracurricular activities. But if it's his admission of guilt, say that 10 times fast, I can't even do it once, there was a moment where he tried to pin the situation on his battle with cancer. He wraps it up by saying he should have tried harder to cancel the culture rather than create more of a problem. He was stripped of all seven Tour de France titles and has since lived in exile among the cycling world. Number seven, where's the beef? In spring of 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalitis or mad cow disease because I'm I can't pronounce that. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cows' central nervous systems, and if humans eat the infected meat, we get zombies. No, but they can contract a deadly variant called Creutzfeldt Jacob disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey Show booked Howard Lyman. The former cattle rancher had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Co-Science Animal Welfare Campaign, and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cow disease to Americans. He pointed out that feeding the remains of a cow to an infected cattle or other animals could facilitate the spread, and that such practices were common in the United States. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat a burger ever again. Her influence and her millions of viewers, though, were so large that only a few hours after this episode aired and she declared that she'd never eat a burger again, the price of beef stocks plummeted, staying at an all-time low for two months. One Texas rancher lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about beef. Well, after six weeks of the trial, she won, leaving one man with no farm and out thousands and thousands of dollars in legal fees. Number six, Tom Cruise. Despite this guy being in the Mission Impossible franchise, he has been in a lot of movies produced by himself. You didn't think Hollywood forgot about Oprah Winfrey's interview with him, did you? I certainly will never. Following the announcement that he was engaged to Katie Holmes in the early 2000s, Tom appeared on an episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show. That is surely the most chaotic moment in TV history. From the moment he steps on stage, things just start to go horribly wrong. He throws his arms up in the air, he rubs her like she's a genius and he's trying to get a lamp out. Seriously, I'm not sure what his thought there was, but he was nuts. Tom jumped on her couch. He grabbed her hands over and over again. She couldn't even get the questions that she had out. Eventually, Oprah was like, I don't care anymore. Just bring this lady out. And the cameras followed him around as he ran through the studio trying to find her. Looks like a nature guy running through a jungle with his camera crew. The moment cemented Tom as a man with many hidden personalities. And while it has not affected his work as an actor per se, ever since that day, whenever he's brought in for press or any kind of interview, all entrances and exits must be locked. Again, this guy may be in movies still, but it's rarely anything new or exciting. Number five, Jay Leno. In 2004, NBC announced that the late night host Conan O'Brien would be taking over as the full-time host of The Tonight Show, replacing Jay Leno in five years. When those five years passed and it was time to upgrade, NBC did not want to lose Leno to another network, so they gave him his own talk show in a prime time spot. The Jay Leno Show failed to capture an audience, and The Tonight Show with Conan and O'Brien was not an instant rating smash. So, by the early 2010s, NBC had dismissed Conan and threw
threw Jay back into the fold. Jay became public enemy number one. People thought that he was the reason Conan lost his job. Oprah invited Leno onto the show to share his side of the story and he didn't do much to save face. He wrote the entire thing off as dramatic and a mess and then decided to play the victim card, claiming that he felt sucker punched by the backlash. He also admitted that when he announced his eventual resignation that he was 100% lying to everybody's face. He wasn't getting out of there anytime soon. He then argued very passive aggressively that NBC was right to reinstall him because under Conan's poor ratings, it marked in his words the first time in 60 years of The Tonight Show that it would have lost money. A poll was conducted on Oprah's website and the consensus was that 96% of the audience hated Leno and missed Conan. Eventually, Jay was replaced by Jimmy Fallon and Conan O'Brien's show Conan was a massive success. Number 4. Monique The beef between comedian and act Monique and Oprah Winfrey goes back to 2010. Monique had just won an Oscar for her performance in Precious in 2009. And leading up to the film's premiere, Oprah interviewed Monique's brother, Gerald, who Monique claimed to have been physical towards her growing up in a truly dark way. In a since-deleted Periscope video, Monique claimed that she gave Winfrey her blessing to do the interview, but was shocked and disgusted when her parents were in the audience. In the years that followed, Monique eventually forgave Oprah for creating such an uncomfortable moment for herself and her family. But following the show, Monique and her family did not make up, exposing that kind of personal family information on TV destroyed the chances of anything, any kind of relationship ever materializing. Number 3. Mackenzie Phillips When people see the words tell all interview on their screens, there is an instant sense of mystery and we get hooked, especially when that celebrity is known for their outlandish behavior and highly documented substance use. Viewers of the Oprah Winfrey show were probably still pretty unprepared for what was about to happen though. The former One Day at a Time star Mackenzie Phillips appeared on her show in 2009 to promote and discuss her soon to be released tell all book High on Arrival. She read aloud a passage describing how after waking up from a substance induced blackout, she discovered her father John was physically forcing himself onto her. When Mackenzie confronted him, he denied everything, but she continued and claimed that the relationship did eventually become consensual. And that's when the audience turned. Mackenzie came on a highly publicized television program and aired her extremely dirty laundry to the world. The world, or should I say her family, responded to the claims and they were actually shocked and felt that these were completely untrue. Ever since that interview, her career and her relationship with her family and well, everybody has been dark and rocky. Number 2. Sarah Ferguson The royal couple are still something to behold, something that a lot of people in the world wish to hear about as often as possible. Back in the day, instead of Harry and Meghan, they had Sarah and Prince Andrew. Now, Much like how Meghan and Harry came on Oprah's show to discuss their side of their story, Sarah did the same in the 1990s. Ferguson sat down with Oprah to discuss her time in the palace after 10 years of marriage to Andrew ended in divorce. According to Ferguson, living in the palace was anything but luxury. She told Oprah that the royal family life was not a fairy tale, but more of a dreadful existence adhering to nitpicked rules. For instance, the windows at the palace could only be opened a certain amount so that they all look in line. And she was reportedly berated one day when she opened a window and was told that it was the wrong thing to do. She also detailed the treatment that she had been receiving from the British media, who were and still are extremely invasive. She came back on the show a few times to basically go over the aftermath of the previous interview, turns out the royal family doesn't like it when you trash it on TV. Eh, who knew? And at number one, Terry McMillan. One thing that Oprah loves to do is bring couples with issues onto her show to make a few bucks off of their problems. Best-selling author Terry McMillan based her novel How Stella Got Her Groove Back on her own life. Like the book's main character, she was a successful divorced middle-aged woman who found love again with a man two decades younger than her. According to Oprah's website, in 1995, McMillan took a trip to Jamaica and fell in love with a 20 year old named Jonathan Plummer. Before long they moved in together and got married, but they eventually split in 2005 when Plummer revealed that he was gay. Revealing the truth to the world resulted in a tabloid frenzy and the couple started bad mouthing each other to the press, with Plummer successfully suing his former wife for spousal support. The argument between these two came to a head thanks to Oprah Winfrey. Hosting both of them on her show in 2005, she allowed them to confront each other live on stage and let out all of their pain and frustration. Shortly after, McMillan sued Plummer for $40 million, citing emotional distress and destruction of reputation. The altercation on her show left McMillan feeling like she needed to make a statement, and she did. In doing so, she ruined the reputation of herself and her ex. Let's jump right in with Rose McGowan. We're going to discuss the controversy surrounding Hollywood's prominent figures and their relationship with talk show host Oprah Winfrey. Rose McGowan, an influential figure in the hashtag MeToo movement and star of the Scream franchise is dis
distance from this trend. McGowan brought attention to a photo from the 2014 Critics' Choice Movie Awards, which shows Winfrey kissing a disgraced producer in Hollywood. McGowan captioned her tweet with some strong words, saying, I'm glad more are seeing the ugly truth of at Oprah. I wish she were real, but she isn't, and added that she is supporting a sick power structure for personal gain. She is as fake as they come, hashtag lizard. This tweet sparked a lot of debate and speculation among fans, with some defending Winfrey and others criticizing her. However, it's important to note that this is not the first time McGowan has called out Winfrey. Now, we all know how relevant Oprah has remained within the industry, so do you think she's part of the problem in Hollywood? I mean, she's pretty powerful. Let us know in the comments below. On to the next, Seth MacFarlane. McFarlane? I don't know. In a tweet posted in 2020, McFarlane okay. acknowledged Winfrey's positive influence through her career as a television host and philanthropist and praised her for using her platform to bring attention to important issues and making a positive impact in society. However, he also expressed his disappointment in Winfrey's frequent promotion of pseudoscience and conspiracy theories on her talk show. He urged Winfrey to use her influential voice to promote facts and science instead of spreading misinformation. The tweet sparked a debate among fans of both McFarlane and Winfrey. Some supported Seth's call for accountability, while others defended Winfrey's right to her own opinions. Despite their differences in opinion, both McFarlane and Winfrey have used their platforms to bring attention to important social issues. Even those who we admire and respect are not immune to criticism and should be all held accountable for their actions. Kid Rock. Kid Rock has never been one to hide his feelings towards Oprah Winfrey. As TMZ highlighted before, Kid Rock had a public outburst about Winfrey at his own establishment, Kid Rock's big honky tonk and steakhouse in Nashville, which resulted in him being escorted out. He tweeted, years ago, my team tried to get me on the Oprah Winfrey show. Her team wanted me to list five reasons why I loved her and her show. I flatly refused. That's the end of it. Kid Rock hasn't been shy about expressing his feelings. In 2008, he clarified his sentiments, telling The Independent, Oprah Winfrey just doesn't sit well with me. I don't trust her. Maybe that's because I'm not one of the 150 million women who hang on her every word. Damn. Kid Rock has made his disdain for Oprah evident on multiple occasions. In 2010, he went as far as calling her a bitch during a live performance at the CMA Awards. However, Kid Rock's animosity towards Winfrey seems to stem from more than just personal feelings. In an interview with The Guardian in 2015, Kid Rock explained his dislike for Winfrey by saying, I don't hate Oprah, quite the opposite. I have a lot of admiration and respect for what she's been able to accomplish in her career. My issue is with the way she uses her platform to push certain agendas and manipulate public opinion. It's obvious Kid Rock believes Winfrey has too much influence over her viewers and uses it to push her own agenda. He also expressed concern over over the potential for her to sway political opinions, stating, I think that's where a lot of people get turned off by Oprah or any celebrity using their platform for political gain. Up next is Seal. Singer Seal didn't hold back his disapproval of Winfrey making his feelings known on social media. Back in 2018, the acclaimed vocalist, best known for his hit song Kiss from a Rose, leveled allegations against Winfrey, claiming she had knowledge of a disgraced producer whose name shall not be named, his actions, for decades. He posted a now deleted Instagram photo of Winfrey with said producer producer with a scathing caption. You'd heard the rumors, hadn't you? Yet you turned a blind eye to the truth that he was preying on unsuspecting, ambitious young actresses. Apologies for my oversight. He continued, when you've been a part of the problem for decades, yet everyone suddenly sees you as the solution. Hashtag sanctimonious Hollywood. Singer Seal's comments about Oprah Winfrey and disgraced producer sparked controversy and brought attention to the larger issue of and harassment in Hollywood. While some praised Seal for speaking out, others criticized him for his harsh words towards Winfrey. This incident also highlighted the complicated relationship between celebrities and their involvement in important social issues. It serves as a reminder that everyone has a responsibility to educate themselves and use their platform for good. The conversation about misconduct in the entertainment industry continues and it is important to listen to all voices and work towards creating a safer environment for everyone. So we must ensure that our society provides equal opportunities and safe spaces for all individuals. Only then can we truly progress towards a more inclusive and just society. Up next, Ludacris. Following his role in the 2004 movie Crash, Ludacris, otherwise known as Christopher Brian Bridges, made an appearance on Winfrey's TV program. The intent was to discuss the film, but the conversation took a different turn. Ludacris told GQ she got many of my points, keeping hers intact. It's her show, but we were discussing racial discrimination, and I felt she was challenging me excessively as a rapper, disregarding my role as an actor for the show. He added, at first I wasn't even invited to the show, it was only the night before when they rang me up to say I could come. After filming, 
Winfrey and I had a short five minute chat. The impression I got was that she believes by hosting rappers, she's giving them more power. It felt like being in a place where you're not welcome. It was already quite awkward. Following the controversial interview, Ludacris received backlash from both fans and critics. Many accused him of being disrespectful towards Winfrey and not understanding the purpose of her show. However, Ludacris defended himself by stating that he was simply speaking his truth and standing up for himself. The incident shed light on a larger issue within the entertainment industry, the portrayal of rappers and hip hop artists. Many have argued that these artists are often stigmatized and pigeonholed into negative stereotypes, while their talents as actors or intellectuals are overlooked. Jason Momoa. In the aftermath of the devastating wildfires that swept through Maui in August 2023, Hollywood star Jason Momoa pointed fingers at two prominent figures, Oprah Winfrey and Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Momoa charged them with, in his own words, stealing money from the poor. This controversy arose from a fundraising initiative that Winfrey and Johnson had organized with the aim of aiding the victims of these wildfires. In the months following the controversy, both Winfrey and Johnson have responded to Momoa's allegations in an exclusive interview with Oprah Magazine. Winfrey stated that she was deeply saddened by Momoa's accusations and denied any wrongdoing on her part. She explained that the fundraiser had been a collaborative effort with Johnson and that all of the proceeds went towards helping the victims of the wildfires. She also added that she had personally donated a large sum to the cause. Angelina Jolie, in an unexpected twist, it appears that two globally recognized humanitarians, Angelina and Oprah, have had some friction. When Winfrey was launching her esteemed project, the Oprah Winfrey Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa, she reportedly reached out to Jolie for assistance. However, according to an insider's account shared with Star Magazine, in 2007, Jolie declined. Winfrey had anticipated Jolie's support given her love for Africa. Disappointed, Winfrey vowed never to ask for Jolie's help in her humanitarian projects in the future. The source also claimed that there might be unresolved issues between the two, stemming from Winfrey's support for Jennifer Aniston during the well-publicized split with Brad Pitt. In recent years, there have been multiple reports of tension and rivalry between Angelina and Oprah. While both women are highly influential figures in their respective fields, many wonder what has caused this apparent friction between them. David Letterman Many assume the beef between David and Oprah started because of an awkward joke at the 1995 Academy Awards, but according to Letterman, the disagreement actually sparked well before that. In a 2010 episode of The Daily Show, he told Jon Stewart the feud predates the Academy Awards. She had a problem with me long before then. He narrated an encounter from a vacation they both happened to be on. Oprah was with Stedman and I was with my then girlfriend Regina. We were having lunch at the same restaurant. I jokingly told Regina, let's have Oprah pick up our check and that's what happened. Letterman convinced the waiter that Winfrey would pay for their lunch. This, according to Letterman, is where the feud started. But Oprah has a different take on the feud's origin. In a 2012 interview with CBS News, she said she felt uncomfortable on his show and avoided any contact with him for 16 years, during which he continuously made jokes at her expense. They've since reconciled their differences. Joan Rivers, in her first national television debut on The Tonight Show in 1985, Oprah Winfrey faced an unexpected blow from from the late Joan Rivers. As Winfrey recounts in her book, Food, Health, and Happiness, she was just getting comfortable when Rivers threw a curveball question, so how'd you gain the weight? Winfrey was taken aback on her big day with the word fat echoing in her mind. Winfrey explains further that Rivers from behind Johnny's large desk scolded her for letting herself gain weight. Rivers' manicured finger pointed at her, reminding her of her single status and challenging her to lose 15 pounds before her next visit. And finally, 50 Cent in the 2006 edition of Elle magazine rapper 50 Cent made a controversial comment about Oprah Winfrey, referring to her as an Oreo. He voiced his dissatisfaction, arguing that while Oprah started her career focusing on the perspectives of black women, she had gradually shifted her attention towards middle-aged white American women to such an extent that he believed she had become one of them. To throw further shade on Oprah, 50 Cent even named his miniature schnauzer after her. However, in 2012, they set their differences aside and had an open discussion on an episode of Oprah's Next Chapter. Visiting 50 Cent at his grandmother's house, Oprah listened as the rapper expressed his grievances about her show's apparent snub of hip-hop artists and her stance against the use of the n-word. The relationship between celebrities and media moguls like Oprah is complex and ever-changing. Some stars have used their platforms to voice their concerns or share their experiences, painting a multifaceted picture of the celebrity life and the media industry. Starting off with objectifying Sidney Crawford, Oprah Winfrey, the queen of talk shows, found herself in the middle of controversy for asking supermodel Sidney Crawford to stand up during an interview to show her body. It happened on The Oprah Winfrey Show, a platform known for its profound conversations. Oprah, always a straight shooter, asked Cindy to stand, catching the supermodel slightly off guard. There was a mix of reactions with some viewers thinking it was completely normal given Cindy's status as a world-renowned supermodel, while others saw it as somewhat objectifying. In hindsight, the controversy invites a 
conversation about body image, respect, and the way we view celebrities. It's important to remember that even as we appreciate the beauty and talent of individuals, we should always strive to respect their comfort and consent. So what's your opinion on this controversial moment? Do you think Oprah was out of line or was it just an innocent request in the context of the interview? Be sure to leave your thoughts down in the comments section. Reflecting on the encounter 37 years later on Apple TV's The Supermodels, Cindy said, I was like the chattel or a child, be seen and not heard. As an iconic supermodel who has graced countless magazines covers, walked down hundreds of runways, and fronted successful advertising campaigns, Cindy Crawford is not one to shy away from the fashion industry's dark side. In the latest Apple TV docuseries, she opens up about her early days as a model in New York City and how she felt pressured to conform to unrealistic beauty standards. Next, asking Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen what clothing size they wore. When Mary-Kate and Ashley appeared on the show in 2004, Oprah brought up rumors that they had eating disorders. After the 18-year-olds told her they tried not to read the good or the bad things people wrote about them, she asked what clothing sizes they wore. This just goes to show how early body image issues can start for young girls in the entertainment industry. Being in the spotlight at such a young age can lead to a warped perception of what is considered normal or acceptable. As they say, beauty comes in all shapes and sizes, but unfortunately, that message isn't always portrayed in Hollywood. The pressure to maintain a certain weight and appearance in the public eye can also lead to unhealthy behaviors and lifestyle choices. Eating just are a serious issue that can have long-lasting effects on an individual's physical and mental health. It's important for young girls in the entertainment industry to have a strong support system and to prioritize their health over societal expectations. But it's not just celebrities who face this pressure. With the rise of social media, everyone is now under constant scrutiny when it comes to their appearance. Asking Nathan Lane about his sexuality. During an interview with Oprah, the issue of Nathan's sexuality was raised given his role as an openly gay character in the movie. Being a private person, Nathan wasn't prepared to delve into this topic publicly at the time, but displaying his quick wit and camaraderie, Robin smoothly diverted the conversation by cracking a lighthearted joke. During the talk show, Robin showed his support for Nathan's character and shared how important representation is in the entertainment industry. He expressed his admiration for Nathan's talent as an actor and praised him for being brave enough to take on such a role. It was quick thinking on Robin's part, but this just goes to show the ignorance in Oprah's interview style. In a 2023 episode of Sunday Sit Down, Nathan expressed his feelings about his encounter with Oprah. Oprah, he said, I don't think Oprah was trying to out me, but I said to Robin beforehand, I'm not prepared. I'm so scared of going out there and talking to Oprah. I'm not prepared to discuss that I'm gay on national television. I'm not ready. And Robin said, oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. We don't have to talk about it. We won't talk about it. Rest in peace, Robin Williams. The issue of representation in the entertainment industry is one that has been gaining more and more attention over the years. It's obvious that there is a need for diversity and inclusivity on screen. This also extends to the LGBTQ plus community where representation has often been lacking or stereotyped. However, with the increasing demand for more diverse and authentic storytelling, we are seeing a positive change in the industry. Drew Brees' awkward moment. During a 2010 appearance on her show, Oprah made an amusing error when she encountered NFL quarterback Drew Brees. Oprah tried to wipe away a smudge on Drew Brees' face thinking it was a lipstick stain, but oh wait, there's no lipstick. It's Brees' birthmark. Talk about a live TV moment. Brees handled the situation with grace and explained it to Oprah who seemed genuinely surprised and quickly moved on with the interview. Personally, I think she shouldn't have even touched him without permission, but we can see this trend already where Oprah doesn't seem to have boundaries when it comes to the guests on her show. However, this incident highlights a bigger issue in our society, the pressure to conform to certain beauty standards. Brees' birthmark is a natural and unique part of his appearance, yet Oprah's immediate reaction was to try and remove it as if it were an imperfection. It's important for us all to learn from this mistake and recognize that everyone is beautiful in their own way. Birthmarks and all, we should celebrate our differences and embrace them instead of trying to hide or change them. This also extends to other aspects of our appearance such as skin color, body shape, and hair texture. Society often puts pressure on individuals to fit into a narrow definition of beauty, causing self-consciousness and insecurities. Prying on Elizabeth Taylor's life. In a classic moment from 1988, Elizabeth Taylor expertly sidestepped Oprah's probing questions regarding her rumored love interests. This amusing interaction saw Oprah playfully chiding Elizabeth for her evasive answers. But this moment also shed light on the many issues celebrities face, the constant scrutiny of their personal lives and relationships. As public figures, they are often subject to intense media attention and speculation surrounding their romantic partners. This intense focus on their love lives can take a toll on both their mental health and relationships. Many celebrities have spoken out about feeling like they constantly have to defend and explain their relationships to the public. This can lead to feelings of pressure, invasion of privacy and even relationship strain. But celebrities aren't the only ones affected by this constant scrutiny. It also affects their partners who 
often have to deal with being thrust into the spotlight without consent or choice. This lack of privacy can make it difficult for their partners to maintain a sense of normalcy and can strain the relationship. When Oprah and Elizabeth Taylor had playful banter about dating rumors surrounding the actress, I mean, Oprah was insistent on getting a straight answer from her guest, but Elizabeth playfully dodged her questions and kept the conversation lighthearted. This exchange between two powerful women in entertainment sheds light on the pressure celebrities face to constantly address things that's going on in their lives. I mean, it is a little exhausting and I probably would hate that too. But despite their celebrity status, these women were able to have a playful and genuine interaction showcasing the power of strong female friendships. Now on to the next. This might be one of the worst ones I've seen. Asking Michael Jackson invasive questions. In 1993, Oprah asked Michael Jackson if he was a virgin, then pressured him to answer when he tried to skirt around it. This moment on the Oprah Winfrey show sparked controversy and backlash as many viewers felt it was inappropriate to pry into the personal life of a celebrity. It also shed light on the double standards and intrusive nature of media interviews. The controversy surrounding Oprah's question to Michael Jackson illuminated the intrusive dynamics often present in celebrity interviews. Public figures, while certainly subjected to media scrutiny, still possess a right to personal privacy. This incident drew criticism as it seemed to cross boundaries of personal decency, delving into a topic that many believed should be considered private even for a public figure. The backlash demonstrated a growing public awareness and rejection of such invasive media tactics, thus further fueling discussions about the ethics of celebrity journalism. As an influential and popular talk show host, Oprah had a significant platform and could easily manipulate the direction of the conversation. Michael Jackson, on the other hand, was a guest on her show and may have felt compelled to answer personal questions in order to maintain a positive image or not offend his host. This power dynamic further highlighted the problematic nature of this particular interview and other similar incidents in the media. Inappropriate interview in front of kids! The turtles were on stage, surrounded by a sea of ecstatic kids. Then Oprah, in her inimitable style, decided to stir the pot. She asked the turtles a relationship question about their human friend April O'Neil, a relationship question to a bunch of mutant turtles in front of an audience of children. But let's get back to that question from Oprah. Why did she think it was acceptable to ask that in front of an audience filled with kids? Sounds irresponsible to me. Let's take a closer look at the situation. On one hand, it could be argued that Oprah was simply trying to have some fun and engage with the audience by asking a lighthearted question. After all, the turtles are fictional characters and therefore not subject to the same societal norms as real humans. On the other hand, we can see why some might find it inappropriate. The turtles are portrayed as young, impressionable heroes who are meant to be role models for children. Asking about their romantic relationships could potentially send mixed messages to young viewers. On to the next, asking Dolly Parton what she's gotten done. The legendary Dolly Parton, an icon known for her country music and vibrant persona, was a guest on The Oprah Winfrey Show. The interview was sailing smoothly until Oprah, with her trademark candor, ventured into a topic that celebrities often shy away from, cosmetic surgery. Yeah, you heard it right. Oprah asked Dolly Parton directly about her cosmetic surgeries, which felt a little out of place or even intrusive to some. And how did Dolly respond? With her signature humor and grace, of course. Worse. She openly admitted to having numerous surgeries but added a twist to it. Dolly joked that if she had the money to make herself look the way she wanted, why wouldn't she? Her honesty and confidence in her own choices was refreshing and empowering. On to the next about Brad Pitt's tattoos. A 2008 interview with Brad Pitt and Kate Blanchett on The Oprah Winfrey Show. During the interview, a curious viewer called in to ask Brad about the meaning behind his tattoos. But here's the catch. Brad chose to remain tight-lipped about it. Brad shook his head with a smile. Ah, you know, I don't really want to talk about them. Interestingly, Oprah didn't let it go just there. In her trademark style, she turned the question back to the fan, leading to a lively and intriguing conversation, completely disregarding the fact that Brad initially did not want to talk about them. Asking about Burt Reynolds' toupee. In a 2021 episode of Literally with Rob Lowe, Oprah admitted to making a significant error. She recalled asking Sally Field an impertinent question about whether her then partner Burt Reynolds slept with his toupee on. Following this, she described the actor's reaction as becoming distant and unresponsive. In the interview, Oprah shared how she regretted asking such a personal question and how it affected her relationship with Sally Field. This incident serves as a reminder that even influential figures like Oprah can make mistakes and should take responsibility for their actions. It also highlighted the importance of being respectful and considerate in interviews, especially when discussing sensitive or private topics. Number 10, unseasoned chicken. I dislike 
dislike unseasoned food more than anyone, I think. Well, probably the same amount as any other person of color. Anyway, Oprah definitely feels the same way I do because when a guest on her show presented her with a plate of beige, sad looking food, she took a bite and immediately asked for extra salt and pepper to be added to this dish of food. To which the guest responded, There is no salt and no pepper. Moment of silence here for the poor bird that died just to be cooked in such a disrespectful manner. Oprah was shocked. The audience was shocked. The dead bird on the plate was shocked. Everyone was shocked. I don't know how this lady thought it would be a good idea to feed a multi millionaire, ultra famous, hella influential black woman a plate of unseasoned chicken. Like, girl, go get some culture. Go taste some mashed potatoes that aren't made from powder, please. Number nine, Jay Leno. In a jaw dropping interview on Oprah, Jay Leno unleashed a ton of confessions and excuses, revealing the messy reality behind his return to The Tonight Show, in which he was accused of having a part in the network's decision to reinstate him as The Tonight Show host while canning Conan O'Brien. Admitting to telling a white lie about retiring in 2004, Leno blamed the chaos on a multitude of factors, including being sucker punched by Jimmy Kimmel while he appeared on The Leno Show. Oprah, surprisingly unsympathetic, challenged Leno on his past jabs at fellow comedians, particularly Jimmy Kimmel's big jaw remark, which led to Leno hitting back at him with dark jabs at Letterman's unfaithfulness towards his wife. Leno defended his decision to accept the role on the show as an attempt to keep his staff employed. He acknowledged the show's failure but justified taking back his old job when offered. A surprising poll result from Oprah's audience revealed overwhelming support for Conan O'Brien in the midst of the mess. Leno's attempt to deflect blame onto NBC's handling of the situation took a dark turn, and the interview left viewers questioning Leno's actions and motives, making it clear that the fallout from this Oprah appearance would definitely linger. Number 8. Cindy Crawford This American model and actress was a guest on The Oprah Show in 1986, when Crawford was just 20 years old, alongside John Casablancas, who was her rep at Elite Modeling Agency at the time. In the resurfaced clip, Oprah asks Casablancas if Crawford has always had her body, before asking her to stand as she states, Now this is what you call a body. Well, now, the supermodel had appeared on the docu-series called The Supermodels, where she reflects on this moment, and she refers to herself as a child because she had not felt seen and not heard. Crawford admits she didn't notice it at the time, but now looking at it, Oprah does state, stand up and show us your body. Show us why you're worthy of being here, which made her uncomfortable as the model says this is not okay, especially from Oprah. As of now, Oprah hasn't commented on this situation, but many viewers have spoken up about this moment that was captured for television. Gig King was actually asked about this situation where she admits she hasn't seen the clip but has heard about it, stating she felt disappointed and surprised in Oprah. However, there isn't any feud or anything between Oprah and Crawford according to King. As she stated, as far as I know, everything is good between Oprah and Cindy. What do you think about Oprah's requests to Crawford during that interview? Number 7. Elizabeth Taylor In 1988, Elizabeth Taylor joined Oprah for an interview where she was questioned about her relationship and the myriad of dating rumors surrounding her at the time. Elizabeth didn't say much to answer these questions as she likely wanted to keep personal information private, but Oprah wanted more. She began to reply sarcastically to Elizabeth by stating, You're so revealing, you've got to stop talking so much, Miss Taylor. Which then Elizabeth clapped back with, This is what your friends wanted, right? Which didn't seem to impress Oprah, as she then said, I just want to know. Tell me so we can all go home. If you tell me, I'll go home. Prior to this interview, Elizabeth had actually given Oprah a heads up and told her to avoid questions about her relationship, but it didn't really seem like Oprah followed these requests, and she even came out to say that this interview was still painful to watch for many reasons, including her bad hair. I mean, especially with the heads up before the interview started, Oprah could have and definitely should have avoided this entire incident by simply following Taylor's requests. Number six, Lance Armstrong. Cyclist Lance Armstrong tried to clear his name when he spoke to Winfrey about using performance enhancing drugs. The host asked him several questions, including, Did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? To which Armstrong quickly answered, Yes, admitting his wrongdoing and stating he would spend the rest of his life apologizing to people and trying to remedy the situation. The cyclist insisted that he was not doping when he returned in 2009, but the US anti doping agency CEO said Armstrong lied again. Also, anti doping agency is kind of a crazy sentence and an even worse or better name. Despite Oprah's achievement in securing the interview, many spoke out about the flaws in the set and camera work, as well as Armstrong's perceived lack of genuine remorse. Drawing comparisons to iconic. 
iconic TV confessions, the suggestion is made that Oprah could have taken a different approach to elicit more compelling responses from Armstrong. Many wonder if Armstrong would have agreed to the interview under a more critical stance, ultimately portraying Oprah as potentially too forgiving and going way too easy on the cyclist. Number 5. James Frey In 2005, Oprah Winfrey's book club picked up the book from author James Frey, which was a memoir. Oprah spoke very highly of the book, giving it a glowing review, but after it was revealed that his memoir was actually comprised of mostly made up stories, he went on Oprah's show to apologize and hopefully to clear his name. There he said, I don't have a lot of respect for the genre. Which okay, pause. Because why would you write a memoir then? It seems like you don't respect yourself at that point. He also claimed that he believed most people who wrote memoirs fabricated many of the stories within. So what he did wasn't that bad I guess? He just got caught. I mean like if you're writing made up stories then you're just a fiction writer at that point. Time to release a dystopian series James Frey. Or wait, does he not respect that genre either? I guess he'd write fiction whether you respected it or not. Number 4. Lindsay Lohan In the own docu-series featuring Lindsay Lohan titled Lindsay, Oprah Winfrey is seen urging Lohan to be truthful and cut out the nonsense in her quest for recovery. The unusual exchange raises concerns about the intertwining of Lohan's recovery process with the reality show format, seemingly unpacking her rehabilitation for public consumption and entertainment. This approach seemingly contradicts the principles of AA, which emphasizes private and anonymous recovery, and publicizing the struggle with addiction can hinder the chances of success. Many questioned Oprah's role in potentially exploiting Lohan Lohan's journey for the sake of entertainment, and noted the inherent risks of making the recovery process a public spectacle. While at the time, this premise seemed to fit Lohan's dual goals of sobriety and making a comeback to the industry, many are still critical of Oprah to this day from seemingly exploiting Lindsay. Number 3. The Olsen Sisters They appeared in a 2004 interview with Oprah where they were confronted with rumors. At the time, the two sisters were 18 years old, and the rumors were regarding these girls and their eating habits. Oprah says, I know a new rumor that's recently surfaced has really upset you, right? You know the one about eating? And the twins responded by saying, either you're too fat or you're too skinny. People are going to write what they want. We try not to read the good, the bad, and to that response it seems like they got the awkward question out of the way, right? Nope, because Oprah thought the appropriate follow up question was, what size are you by the way? And of course this clip resurfaced all over the internet in 2021 with many viewers feeling bad for the twins, especially because Oprah pointed that rumor out towards the these young stars, which made some fans believe the twins were uncomfortable. Number 2. Sally Field Oprah asked this actress an extremely uncomfortable and honestly inappropriate question regarding her former partner, Burt Reynolds, during a sit down years ago. Winfrey asked Fields whether Burt slept with his toupee on or off, and for Fields' response, she went cold on Winfrey. Winfrey herself addressed this awkward interview back in 2021, where she revealed she now cringes at the thought of asking Fields that horrific and very surface level kind of boring interview question. She also understands why Fields went cold following that question, but Oprah, as she said, knows she deserved it. Oprah does claim her producers said she had to ask Fields that question, which she did, and it caused Fields to completely shut off and Oprah says they were both unable to get into the groove of the interview again. Number 1. Tom Cruise This one was extremely popular and talked about. Though if we're being honest, I really don't see what all the fuss and up was about, but you know, whatever, it was early 2000s, I wasn't alive, whatever. This gets our first place spot due to the damage it was expected to do on the ultra famous Tom Cruise's career. While appearing on Oprah's talk show, Tom Cruise began jumping up and down on the couch like an actual child, screaming that he was in love and then air punching the floor or something like that, I'm honestly not sure. Tell me what you think he's doing, please, because uh, I, don't, I don't know. Anyway, Oprah's reaction to this whole ordeal is what actually makes this entire thing so awkward. She looks at him like he is actually insane, like he's this weird creature, which I mean, fair, but it creates a very awkward air that surrounds the entirety of the interaction. After the incident, Tom Cruise faced a lot of backlash in the up and coming tabloid universe and displayed for the first time just how much power and influence tabloids are capable of wielding. So coming up first on the list, we have the NDAs. Now, confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Now, over 500 of Oprah's staff members were forced to sign the document, and one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was apparently stopped by the courts as she was still tied to the agreement that she signed. 
The NDAs were not meant to be a way to keep just show secrets safe, but to keep any and all of Oprah's personal secrets safe as well. Now, according to Elizabeth, the document was signed by almost everyone in her life, on and even off of set. It's said that she may have this look of sweetness and kindness, but that's not how she is at all. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. Then in 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company after Unicus Performance Training claimed that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving advertising with her name or the website of the show. Now, up next, we have her stepmom exposing her. Now, on air, Oprah is portrayed as a wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmom, there is an unknown side to Oprah, hidden from fans for years. Now, according to Barbara, who is her stepmom, Oprah may be one of the most controlling people you will ever meet in your entire life. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house when they tried to visit, forcing them to stay in hotels with money out of their own pocket. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger when it came to her staff, with several people being fired and left and right over the years, but couldn't come out about the situation because of the NDAs. But that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows Oprah to stay at her house for for visits, something that Oprah actually hated. The first time she stayed over, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets were not a thousand threads and that her bath towels were not big enough. This woman has billions of dollars to do anything she wants and what she wants is to make her family feel like a burden. Next up on the list, we have the supplement overload controversy. Now, Oprah has had plenty of controversial people on her show, from so-called medical experts to psychologists to celebrities. Now, what Whatever is good for TV is good for Oprah. Now, one particular incident that caused a ton of backlash for Oprah was when she did an interview with Suzanne Somers. Now, she was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets and how she was able to look so young. Now, according to some, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help, and Suzanne claimed that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone into the other arm. And progesterone is a fancy way of saying steroids. She claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamin A's a day, which was 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and a self author, but surprise, surprise, she actually was not. Medical experts actually started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses like cancer. Now, despite Suzanne's claim that her specialty made non-FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and safe, they're actually just synthetic, conventional hormones that you can buy from a pharmacy. Now, Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that the methods were useful, even claiming that she had used the methods herself that made her feel so incredible. So this lady would rather risk her audience getting cancer than just telling the truth. Up next, we have her billionaire advocacy. Now, Oprah has been claiming to be many things since the Maui backlash has begun. Now, a good boss and a charitable woman and an advocate for the island of Maui. Now, by starting this fund and donating her spare millions, she had made her mark in the public as a woman who cares. So much that she is asking you to give her money, isn't that so sweet? The main reason that people believe that Jason has not spoken on Oprah is because he knows that she is an absolute phony. So as mentioned, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have vested stake on the island. Now, Oprah has had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her at times. When the fire started raging, she started funding raising. Up next we have what the free and free really means. Now who could forget Oprah's famous words, you get a car. Now this moment was historical on her series and has been said over and over and over again. However, what almost no one knows is that it's not as simple as here, take the keys and drive away. Now when someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. Now for Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they actually wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would actually have to pay over $7,000 in taxes first. Now while Oprah's studio would cover the sales tax and registration for each car, the audience members were given a choice to either pay seven grand and take the car, or simply just take the cash instead. 
Now the infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were according to Oprah in desperate need of a new car. They along with the audience received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be their new car. Now everything has a catch even now. Now for someone who is known for being charitable and generous, the word free clearly meant something different to Oprah. Now up next on the list we have Stand Up Cindy. Now Cindy Crawford who is a model and actress has called Oprah out over their 1986 interview that took place on her show where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Now Crawford reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels. The documentary focuses on the careers of several models like Linda Everless and of course Cindy Crawford. Now in a clip from the documentary, Winfrey is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked, did she always have this body? This is unbelievable, stand up. She actually made her stand up and then she said this is what I call a body. Now Cindy as anyone else would be was visibly uncomfortable and was standing up for the studio audience as they cheered when they showed off her figure. Now according to Cindy, she felt like a child at the moment being told what to do by her superior. Now she felt that at the moment, she was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here. Now at the time, this was just some weird thing Oprah asked her to do, but it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. Now the most shocking thing for her was the fact that Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do, the woman known for her kindness and generosity made her feel like a puppet. Now up next we have Where's the Beef? So in the spring of 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of mad cow disease. Now according to the FDA, the disease destroys cows central nervous system and if humans eat the infected meat, we'll basically get sick and turn into zombies. But they can actually contract a deadly variant called Resfelt Jacob disease. Now during the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman, who was a rancher who adopted a vegetarian lifestyle and went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Animal Welfare campaign and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cow to Americans. He he pointed out that feeding the remains of mad cows to already infected cattle or other animals could have facilitated the spread and that those types of practices were common in the US. Now Oprah was visibly disgusted and right then and there vowed that she would never eat a burger again. Now her influence and her millions of viewers were so large that only a few hours after the episode aired and she declared she'd never eat a hamburger again, the price of beef stock plummeted staying at an all time low for over 2 months. One Texas rancher actually lost an estimated $6.7 million and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about American beef. Then after a 6 week trial, she actually won leaving one man with no farm and out of $1000 in legal fees all because she was disgusted. Now up next we have Oprah's stance on weight loss. Now Oprah Winfrey has been called out for using weight loss medication despite being a long time ambassador for Weight Watchers. Now the famous talk show host has confirmed that she uses an unnamed substance to help her control her weight. Now in a revealing conversation, Oprah said her new slim figure is thanks to the medication and a healthier lifestyle overall. She said, I now use it as I feel I need it and the fact that there's a medically approved prescription for managing weight and staying healthier in my lifetime feels like a relief, like a redemption, like a gift and not something to hide behind and once again be ridiculed for. She went on to say, I'm absolutely done with the shaming from other people and particularly myself. However, the fans felt the billionaire was being hypocritical given that she is a proud spokesperson for Weight Watchers, a company she has worked with since 2017. Now next up on the list we have her exposing herself. Now Oprah is top on the list for getting exposed because she has been doing it to herself since day one. Now her talk show is all about bringing the most vulnerable people onto the show to get views. She's brought violence victims, health experts and fake psychologists and convicted felons onto her programs all for the sake of profit. As the years went by, her style was adapted by more and more studios, creating shows like Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz, both equally as controversial. Now, not to mention a few years ago when she wrote a book detailing her early life and rise to the top, revealing some truly dark truths about her life at home. 
Now she herself was considered to be a menace by her own family, but it seems to be whatever negative juju lived in the house rubbed off on Oprah 100%. Now last on the list we have Seal and Hank. This man may be known for his vocal chops, but he should be known for his meme making abilities. Now just days after the Golden Globes, Seal posted a meme on Instagram consisting of several photos of Oprah Winfrey cozying up with a man's who name I am not allowed to say on the internet because he is so horrendous. Now he is the guy who produced half of Quentin Tarantino's movies and he was actually the main cause of the Me Too movement and for the rest of this segment he will be referred to as Hank. So Oprah and Hank were photographed spending time together and one photo even made it look like Oprah was pushing singer Rita Ora toward Mr. Hank. Now Seal captioned the image saying a bunch of stuff that I can't quote here but the meme itself said when you have been part of the problem for decades but suddenly they all think you are the solution. I'm not sure how deep this feud goes on but from the surface it seems that the seal has been trying to warn us that something is up for years. Number 10 Underpaying Celebrities This past week on Instagram, Taraji P. Henson delivered a tearful interview that touched on her financial struggles and alluded to the fact that she was being underpaid. And all of this happened while she was promoting the new musical The Color Purple, which was produced by Oprah herself. During this interview, she expressed that she was tired of working hard and getting paid a fraction of what she deserved. In fact, at one point she said she was even contemplating leaving her acting career behind. She told the host that she hears people talk about how hard she works, but the math just isn't mathing. So there is an entire team of people above her that make the majority of the money in the film industry. She voiced her frustrations that every time she does something and breaks through another glass ceiling in Hollywood, when it comes time to negotiate, she is somehow at the bottom again like she never did what she just did. So that wears on her mental health because the question is, why? And what does it mean for her as an actor? Gabrielle Union was there and she backed up her claims saying that there was not a word of a lie told by this woman. Viola Davis also reposted that clip to her Instagram simply with the caption this with a few hands pointing up. A little while back Taraji was seriously considering leaving the US altogether and living in another country. Considering how stellar of an actor she is along with the rest of the cast, Hollywood really needs to get their act together and just pay their people. Number 9 Blackballing. Now this story is crazy. The famous comedian Monique has spoken out about confronting Oprah Winfrey over an episode of her talk show that involved her estranged family in 2010. She accused Oprah as well as filmmakers Lee Daniels and Tyler Perry of blackballing her in the industry. So in an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Monique recounted the strain in her relationship with Oprah because of the time that the talk show host welcomed her estranged family, including her eldest brother, onto the show in 2010. Following her Oscar win that year, Oprah informed Monique that her brother called her and wanted to be on the show to let parents know how they can watch out for creepy people. Apparently she said, do you want to come on the show because he wants to apologize to you. In response she said, Oprah I don't want any part of that. While she gave her blessing to tape the show with her brother, she was horrified to see other family members like her parents and another one of her brothers downplay what actually happened to her. Number 8 Dissing The View While speaking on The View earlier this week, Oprah appeared to drop some major shade both towards the film The Color Purple and the people who were involved with The View. So the producers of The View were very upset that she would not be appearing alongside the cast of the film on one of their episodes. They were hoping to have a kind of reunion involving Whoopi Goldberg and Oprah because as we know they both starred in the 1985 version of The Color Purple. But that turned out to be a missed opportunity because Oprah did did not appear on the program. The reason that The View was particularly annoyed with her absence is because she has been appearing on other talk shows to promote the film. She went on The Drew Barrymore Show and Sherry Shepard's Sherry. So around the same time she gave a candid interview with People Magazine about her recent weight loss and how she was aided by medication. But back to The View, despite Oprah's absence, the episode was well received and Whoopi said that she felt a strong connection with the people who did end up showing up. 
Number seven, that Drew Barrymore moment. It seems like Drew just cannot keep her hands to herself and fans have become quite outraged at her behavior. The actress was blasted as cringy after uncomfortably caressing Oprah Winfrey on an episode of the Drew Barrymore show. In the clip, the two of them were seen cozied up on the couch while talking about the importance of interacting with the studio audience. Drew tightly held onto Oprah's hand while running her other hand up and down her arm. She said, something that I learned about you because I didn't know this in detail was that you would spend time with the audience outside of the show you were filming. Oprah then seemed to be trying to get out of her grasp because she adjusted her seating position while answering that question. She said, it is necessary. My crew used to be like, oh my God, how much time are you going to spend talking to the audience? Drew then let go of her guest while she was preparing to ask something else. For her part, Oprah then started talking with her hands while applauding Drew for running the daytime talk show without an audience during the pandemic. Number six, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood, as we know. In Kitty Kelly's tell-all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co-workers and guest stars were made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made Tom Cruise's muffin. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign the document. Apparently, one former employee by the name of Elizabeth Cody tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was stopped by the courts because she was still tied to the agreement that she signed. These NDAs were not meant to be a way just to keep the show secret safe, but any and all secrets that Oprah kept as well. According to Elizabeth, the documents were signed by almost everyone in her life. Now, she might have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that is not exactly how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company, Unica's Performance Training, claiming that they were being fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving the advertising with her name or the website of the show. Number five, strange beliefs. Oprah has had plenty of controversial people on her show, from the so-called medical experts to psychologists and even celebrities. But one particular incident that caused a lot of backlash for her was when she did an interview with Suzanne Summers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets about how she was able to look so young. According to Summers, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help, and she claims that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone in her other arm. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stood the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and a self-help author, but surprisingly she was not. A medical experts started bashing Oprah claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses, potentially even cancer. Despite Suzanne's claim that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and are safe, they are actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you could buy from a pharmacy. So Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% that the methods were useful, even claiming to have used these methods to make her feel incredible. So this person would rather risk her audience potentially getting cancer than just tell them the truth. Number four, the car situation. So everyone knows Oprah's famous words, you get a car and you get a car and everyone gets a car. This was a historical moment of her series and it was parodied time and time again. In fact, it is still memed to this day. However, what many people don't know is that when someone gives out anything on television, there is always a catch. Of course there is. For Oprah's audience, the catch was that if they wanted to drive away in their brand new car, they would have to pay over $7,000 in taxes first, while Oprah's studio would cover the sales tax and the registration for each car. Their audience members were given a choice to either pay the seven grand or simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 real teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a new car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box that was all caught on camera that Oprah claimed to be there for the new car. But of course, everything has a catch. For someone who was known as being charitable and generous, the word free clearly means something completely different to Oprah. Number three, fake memoir. 
Oprah launched her book club in 1996 and had a reading encouragement segment on her talk show where she talked about any book that she chose into a bestseller. In September of 2005, Oprah picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Brent about his years-long struggle with substance issues. A Million Little Pieces became the best-selling non-fiction book of the year and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book that Oprah called gut-wrenching. But the following year, a news outlet ran an explosive article about Frey after it was discovered that he had either made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there is a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal train crash that took the lives of two teenagers. But it turned out that he was never on that train, nor did he have any involvement in that situation. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to return to the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of readers around the world. She asked James why he felt the need to lie to herself and her readers and he tried everything, making every excuse in the world. He claimed that he altered a lot of details but that the overall plot was still real. The studio audience then responded with a massive wave of boos, gasps and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience as it was not her intention. But by that point, the damage was already done. Number two, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata, aka unwelcome to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appears on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so-called feud was addressed. It turned out that Oprah had actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime after the 2006 snub, and Whoopi confronted her, leading to an adorable moment between them. She asked Oprah why she was mad, to which Oprah replied, why am I mad at you? I thought you were mad at me. And after this, they mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute. And coming in at number one, Sydney Crawford. The model and actress called out Oprah over her 1986 interview that took place on her talk show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Cindy reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV+. This documentary spotlights the careers of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course, Cindy Crawford. So in a clip from the documentary, Oprah is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she asked, did she always have this body? This is unbelievable, stand up. Now that is what I call a body. At this point, Cindy is visibly uncomfortable and then she stands up before the studio audience cheered and showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment being told what to do. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type of situation. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do. But eventually it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments of her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for her was the fact that this was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman who was supposedly known for her kindness and generosity also made her feel like a puppet.